Have you, have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. Science Max! This episode of Science Max is a messy one. We're looking at solids, liquids, and gases, and things in between, like cornstarch mud. Today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Behold the power of states of matter! Greetings, Science Maximites! <laughs> I'm Phil McCordick. <laughs> I think I overdid it with the fog machine. Uh, this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Can you even see me? Let's, let's go over here. Today we're talking about states of matter. Now there are three main states of matter. Solid, like this table, liquid, like the water in this beaker, and gas. Yes, thank you. And we're also gonna be looking at the things that kind of go in between. Things that are sometimes solid, sometimes liquid, like cornstarch mud, which is very easy to make. All you need is water and cornstarch, which you can get at the grocery store. Mix it up however much you want, just remember, two parts cornstarch to one part water. Twice as much of this than you have of that. Very easy, mix it up and you get cornstarch mud, which sort of seems like a liquid unless you hit it. And then it becomes solid. But if I pour it, it's a liquid. Even if I hold it in my hand and I hit it really fast, it turns into a ball and it will stay in a ball as long as I keep hitting it or squeezing it, but as soon as I stop, it turns into a liquid again. Now, we're gonna max this out. We'll go through the portal and learn more about solids, liquids, and gases. Yeah, right. That's why I'm going to the Center for Skills Development and Training at, oh no wait, that's the code for the fog machine. Wait, uh, stop. Stop, it seems to be stuck. Oh, uh, never mind, never mind. Uh, I'll fix it later. <laughs> Uh, right. Hey, Judy, how are you? Hey, Phil, how are you? Good. Judy is going for her PhD in chemistry, right? Yes. Fantastic, because that means you can explain cornstarch mud to me. Now, is this a solid or is it a liquid? Well, it kind of has properties of both. It's called a non-Newtonian fluid, uh -huh. so that makes it a liquid. A liquid? Well, I mean, it pours like a liquid, but when you hit it, it's a solid. So why does it turn solid when you hit it? So when you're pouring it, the particles are still far apart, uh -huh. so they can't interact with each other, and so they stay a liquid. But when you're hitting it, you're jamming the particles together, and they line up to become a solid. Now, does it still work the same way if we have a lot more of it? Uh, it should. Great, because I've got this 20 kilogram bag of cornstarch, and I have 34 more of them. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, but I think you'll need a much bigger container. N much bigger container, great. Um, I got some wood over there. I want you to go, and I'll follow you. All right. I'll follow you. I got, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah, thanks, Ramona. And give me one of them fizzy drinks. Not too fizzy, just sort of medium fizzy. Thanks a lot. Hello, do you have trouble knowing what is a solid, liquid, or gas? Are you confused by jello? I mean, which is it? Is it a solid or is it a liquid? Water is a liquid, but what about when it's ice? Well, you gotta know your states of matter. There are three main states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And there are three rules that you need to figure out which one of them is which. Does it flow? Does it fit the shape of its container? And can you squeeze it? Rule number one, does it flow? Solid, liquid, gas. Here's a gas, does it flow? Do the particles pour over each other and cascade down? Yeah, yeah they do. Does a liquid flow? Yeah, yeah it does. Does a solid? Nope. Rule number two, what happens when you put it in a container? Does it take the shape of the container? Gases 
take the shape of the container. Liquids, takes the shape of the container. Solids, do not take the shape of their container. No! know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I get the whole pouring and taking the shape of the container, but come on. Liquids and gases, they do both of those things. Well, it all comes down to rule number three. Can you squeeze it? Now, solids, you, you can't, you can't really squeeze them. Liquids, you can't really squeeze them. Gases, haha, -ha, bam, you can squeeze them. You see, gases compress. Liquids and solids, they don't really compress very well. The other difference between gases and liquids is Gases will take the shape and the volume of the container they're put in. Liquids don't do that. So there you go. Solid, liquid, gas. And the rules. Does it flow? Does it take the shape of the container? And can you squeeze it? Now you know your states of matter. That'll be 650. Cash only. So what is cornstarch mud and how does it work? Well, cornstarch mud is a non-Newtonian fluid which means it behaves differently than you or Newton would expect. Here's cornstarch and here's water. Cornstarch is made up of large blocky molecules like this. Water is made up of much smaller, rounder molecules like this. When you put them together, it looks something like this. It all has to do with how the molecules slide past each other. When you put light pressure or slow pressure on the mud, the water molecules and cornstarch molecules have time to shift out of the way. But when you put a sudden pressure on it, the water molecules squirt out of the way, but the cornstarch molecules don't have enough time. So you get a section that's nearly all cornstarch, which acts as a solid. Cornstarch mud is a shear thickening fluid. Shear is talking about the force of things sliding around. In this case, the molecules. So when the shear force is strong, the fluid thickens. Shear thickening. So here's the plan. If Judy and I make enough cornstarch mud, could we run across it? Let's find out. Yeah, I think mine is just the right consistency. How's yours, Judy? I think I'm ready too. This is much harder than I thought. Yeah, it's really hard to get it mixed at the very beginning, but uh, yeah. mine is ready to go. Okay, here we go. Sounds First good. batch. You ready? Yep. Dump it in. Woo! Woo! Mm -hmm. oh. Hmm. I thought that would be more. I thought so too. It's really not filling this up very much, is it? No. Huh, that's a lot of cornstarch. This is, um, this is great, but I think we're gonna have to go a little faster than this. I think we need some sort of mixing device. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to do this by hand. We can get some sort of machine to help us. Yeah. Right on, high five. Oh. <coughs> uh, we shouldn't high five when we have this stuff on our hands. Nope. Yeah, good call. Mmm, this science is delicious. This is rock candy. It's basically crystallized sugar, and you make it by turning a solid into a liquid and then back to a solid again. Here's how you can make it at home. You need a container that you're not gonna need for a while, and some water, some sugar. You can use brown or white. I like to use brown. And an adult. Here's why you need an adult. You wanna dissolve three cups of sugar into every cup of water, and you can't do that unless you heat the water. So get an adult, a saucepan and heat the water up, pour the sugar in and keep stirring until it's all dissolved. Then pour it in your container and let it cool down. Then you'll need a shish kebab skewer, which is something you can get at the grocery store. Cut it down to the right size so it fits nicely into your container. And then dunk it in your sugar and get some crystals coated around the stick. These are seed crystals and they get the whole process started. Now you have to wait for these to dry, otherwise they'll just fall off the stick when you put it in the water. So I've got one here that has dried out. You'll also want something to keep it from falling in the top of the container, so I'm gonna use a clothespin. Put it in there and dunk it in the container like that. And now for the final step, if you want, you can add food coloring. I like to use red because it reminds me of science. And I'm gonna use the stick to actually stir that up a little bit. There we go. Now, the dissolved sugar crystals in the water will slowly grow on the crystals that are already attached to the stick, and it will eventually grow into a rock candy 
pop. But it takes about a week. No, I'm just kidding. I've already got one that's standing by. Here we go. This one has been growing for about seven days. And there you go, rock candy. Delicious science. Now, how could we make this any better? I mean, it's crystallized sugar. It doesn't get any more maxed out than that, does it? Yeah, it does, come on. This is a giant container of sugar water, and I've been brewing a massive rock candy uh, crystal in it for a while, but uh, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of getting a little bit too big to fit out the top of the container, so. Uh, um, you know what, I'm just gonna put that back in there. And chalk that one up to science, because, well, eating a rock candy crystal that big would definitely not be good for my teeth, so. Yeah. So our big experiment is to take a whole lot of cornstarch and fill a trough to see if we can run on it. But mixing it by hand was going to take forever. So Judy and I got a drill with a mixing attachment on the end. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> All right, so Judy, I'm noticing a bit of a problem here. What is it? Well, if I mix at the top, everything's fine. But as soon as I get it a little bit deeper, and then it gets really tough, and the whole bucket starts to spin, and the drill stops. Yeah, I think it's because the drill's trying to mix it too fast. When we're mixing it by hand, it's slow, and you can still let it stay a liquid, but now you're just making it a solid. Right, because it's a sheer thickening fluid, exactly. so if you hit it really quickly with something, like the blades of this spinning really quickly in the thing, it'll suddenly turn into a solid, and it'll be really hard to mix. Yep. So we go slow. Going slow. Going slow, suddenly realizing that if we go slow, we'll be here forever. Yep. You know what I think we need? Whoa, sorry. You know what I think we need? We need a different way to mix this. Yep. We need a way to mix more of it, and we need a way that it doesn't hit it with blades that suddenly go through it really quickly. Something that can mix on a large scale, but slowly. I have just the thing. Come with me. All right. The interesting thing about bubbles is they're a gas surrounded by a liquid. So get some dish soap and some water, and then be science maximites and find things around the house that you can make bubbles out of. Just about anything that has holes will do. Or, mm -hmm. or I like this one. I call it the loud bubble. it out. I'm here at the Ontario Science Center, and this is Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Hey, how's it going? Good. So you are amazing at bubbles. Uh, I am. I've been practicing for a while. Let's get started. Okay. You're going to make an okie dokie sign like this. Uh -huh. You're going to dip it right into our bubble solution. Make, come on, get right in okay, there, right, right in, in there. Make sure you get it all. Oh, that's, that's a little too much. Well, that's then good. I can make two. And then you're going to keep that okie dokie sign. You're going to blow very gently. Nice. I brought these two giant sticks here, and I don't know if you noticed, but I've got a smoke machine here. Right. So we'll turn that on, and then if you press that green button there, you're gonna shoot some smoke, and we're gonna try to catch that smoke in a giant bubble. You ready? Okay, and I'm gonna try to... Oh, that was so that was close. Great. Did you see wow. that one? You give it a shot. Nice! Oh, check yeah. that! That was amazing! <laughs> that was huge. Try it again. Let's see if I can get the smoke so machine. Here we go. Go for it, go for it. Push right towards. Oh, check that out, you did it! Look at that, look at that! No! Smoke, and it, yeah. bounces. it bounces on the floor because the floor, it doesn't have any oils like our hands do. Isn't that amazing? That was oh great. my god, that was so cool. That was great. You know what I think we should do? What's that? Giant bubble, tons of smoke. Done. Okay, here we go. Let's do it, you ready? Giant bubble, tons of smoke, go. Awesome! Oh my god, <laughs> look at that! Look at that, that's crazy! Maxed out bubble. Well, there you go. Giant smoke-filled bubbles. Awesome. Yeah. 
Judy and I tried mixing the cornstarch mud using a drill with a mixer attachment, but it didn't work. We should have known better. Here's the mixer in our cornstarch mud. Usually, a mixer works by going really fast and mixing everything together. But remember that cornstarch mud is a sheer thickening fluid. So, when the blades of the mixer tried to go fast through the cornstarch mud, it did what it always does, turn solid. The faster and harder you try to move it, the more solid it will become. This means the only way to mix it would be if we made the drill go very, very slow, which wouldn't speed things up at all. So with the drill another lost cause, Judy and I okay. need the biggest thing around that could mix stuff up. Come on back. Good. Little bit more. Perfect. Ha 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 ha. A cement truck. A cement truck is a perfect thing to mix because all we have to do is get all the cornstarch up in here and it'll mix it and it doesn't move it too fast. It goes nice and slow, so hopefully a sheer thickening fluid will be fine. I'm gonna get Judy. She's driving the truck. Hey, Judy, that's perfect. The only problem is we needed to get all of those bags of cornstarch into the hopper of the cement truck. I didn't think it would be this messy. We needed to call the entire Science Max build team to help us out. This is possibly the messiest thing I've ever done. Awesome! Woo. Hey Judy, you wanna you wanna lift up any bags? I'm okay, thanks. That's okay. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun, so uh, I can do them. Cool. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> I got most of it, I got most of it. All right, I think we're done. I think that's enough bags. Let's start the mixing. So, what do you think, Judy? Do you think it's gonna work? I think so, because you're mixing at a very large volume, but at a very low speed. Yep. So throughout the process, it'll stay a liquid until we're ready to run across it. That sounds exactly like the kind of science I like to see. You know what I really like is that every time I move, more cornstarch comes off. It's like, it's like I'm a human fog machine. This is liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up most of the air we breathe, but if you get it really, really cold, it turns into a liquid. The fun thing is you can use it to make other things really, really cold too, like this banana. I have frozen this banana solid thanks to the liquid nitrogen, and normally a mushy banana would not be able to hammer in a nail, but, whoa, because it's frozen, I can hammer this nail into this block of wood. So that got me wondering, if I can turn a banana into a hammer using liquid nitrogen, could I turn a pumpkin into a sledgehammer? Let's find out. Pumpkin sledgehammer, take one. No, I, I think the answer is no, you cannot turn a pumpkin into a sledgehammer with liquid nitrogen. All you can do is make a really, really big mess. I'm gonna have to clean this up, aren't I? Now we have a cement truck to help us do the mixing for our cornstarch mud. After making a giant mess getting the cornstarch into the cement truck, it's time to see if it worked. Hey, Phil, how's it going? Yeah, it looks like it's mixing pretty well. I'm really glad we are not doing this by hand because it'd take, a, it'd take a really long time. We've almost got it at the right consistency, but it's taken some time. But it's getting a little dark out, Judy. I don't know, do you, do you want to quit and go home? No. Of course not. That's not what we do in science. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's see it. Let's see if it's... I like how it comes down in little steps. And look, it's still, it's working just like it should. I hit it, and it's solid, but you can see it's pouring like a liquid. Yeah, here comes a big wave. Wow. Here it comes. Oh! Wow! 
And it's totally filling up. Oh, yeah. It's filling up really fast. I think we should stop pouring very soon. Yep, we may not have a big enough trough. Yep. Hey, liking it. Good. Yep. I think it's time. It's not even done pouring, but I'm going to try it. OK, you ready? Whoa. <laughs> You have to get back onto the sides before you stop moving. Or else it becomes a liquid. All right, it's your turn. OK. Here. Go. OK, ready? OK. You got you to hit your feet really fast. All right. Here, go. Yeah. Oh, that actually works. Because cornstarch mud is a sheer Whoa. thickening fluid, Whoa. it means it stays a liquid until you hit it suddenly, like with your hands, or in this case, our feet. And then it turns to a solid. So as long as Judy and I keep slapping our feet down with enough force, we can walk on top of it. One more dance. All right. And let's tell you what, we'll do one more dance. All right, let's do that. Okay, ready? All right. And, and go. All right. All right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> We've done it. Solids, liquid, gases. Thanks very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large. Woo! Hey, Judy. Catch. <laughs> I have to be careful because the banana will shatter if I'm not careful. I think it's stuck on the bottom. I call this one the loud bubble. Uh, oh, well. Uh, I call this one the loud bubble. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. This episode of Science Max is all about hot and cold. A giant hot air balloon. Dry ice. The coldest temperature possible. Absolute zero. And whatever this is. Blubber suit. All on this episode of Science Max. Experiments at large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. We're going to be making one of the easiest and one of the hardest experiments to do. Here's what we're going to make, a hot air balloon. And it's pretty easy to make. That's why it's one of the easiest experiments. All you need is a plastic bag, but not any plastic bag, the kind of plastic bags you get at the grocery store to put your fruit in. That kind of plastic is very thin, very light, good for hot air balloons. And you just want to put two paper clips on the bottom of the bag to hold the bottom down. Now, here's the other thing you need. You need an adult and a hairdryer. Turn the hairdryer on, put the heat on the highest setting, and the fan on the lowest setting. The air inside the bag is getting hotter, which means the molecules are moving faster, and they're getting further apart, which means there's going to be less of them in the same space. Less molecules means less weight, and that means it's going to be lighter. The bigger the difference in temperature between the air inside the bag and the air outside the bag, the better it's going to work. So I recommend doing this outside, actually, on a cold day. When it's been long enough, turn the hairdryer off and it will float. <laughs> now, it won't float very long because the air inside the bag will quickly return to its original temperature, and it will no longer be any lighter than the air outside the bag. But it's definitely fun to fly for a while, while it lasts. So that's what we're going to do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're going to max out the hot air balloon and make a giant hot air balloon. Yeah, I, I know what you're thinking. You're, you're thinking, Phil, they already exist. Why don't you just get a giant hot air balloon? I mean, they're big and you, no, 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 no. There's no fun in that. I want to make one I built myself. I don't think I'm going to be able to fly in it, but it'll still be pretty cool, I bet. I just need someone to help me. Um, oh, I know, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. Hopefully she's not busy. Hey, 
Kayla, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I was wondering if I could get your help with an experiment. Do you have some time? Yeah, I'd love to help out. Awesome. Sure. Okay, let's go back to Science Max headquarters and I'll show you what we're gonna do. Okay, nice. so ready? Here we go. Oh, no, oh. still here. Still here. Why are we still here? Uh, That's weird. Okay, well, I know, I know, I know. No? Oh. Why is the code not working? I think it's the Science Center code. Try me. Try oh, me it's the lab code. <laughs> right. Phil, are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine. So, Michaela, I'm glad you're here because today I want to max this out. This is my hot air balloon. It was better before, I, but I smushed it in my pocket. But what I did is I, I used a hair dryer yeah. and then I put it in and I heated the air and, and then it, it rises up. Oh. So, in order to max it out, Pretty simple. I just get larger bags, right? And then I thought we could cut them and tape them together to make a much larger balloon. It's a good idea, but you know, if we're making a hot air balloon, we need to make sure our materials are really light. Uh, the duct tape seems a little heavy. Even this bag seems a little heavy to me. In terms of, oh, you In mean the weight. kind of plastic it is? Yeah, might it be a little bit. seems really thick, this one. Well, uh, do you know for sure? I've never tried it before. All right, well, that's science. We should try it and see what happens. Let's try it. Okay, so I'll cut along the side of the bag. See that? Carbon dioxide gas. Our bodies breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Did you see it? Oh, take another look. How about now? No, you didn't see it, right? Because carbon dioxide is invisible unless you freeze it. This is dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. And this is wet ice. It's not really called wet ice. It's frozen water. Now, you know what temperature water freezes at? Starts with a zero, ends with a, well, it's actually zero, zero degrees Celsius. And this freezes at negative 79 degrees Celsius. It's much colder. I have to hold onto it with a glove because if I held onto it with my bare hands, I'd get frostbite. So here's the experiment. If I pour some liquid water on the dry ice, will it freeze again? Let's find out. Because the dry ice is so much colder than the freezing point of the water, the water begins to freeze from the bottom up in room temperature air right before our eyes. Whoa, totally frozen. Cool. Cool. In order to build our hot air balloon, Michaela and I are taking clear garbage bags cutting them along the seams so they end up as one thin sheet of plastic and taping them all together with duct tape into a balloon. Okay, so that's, nice. how many bags is that? It's like 12 bags. 12, so you think that's big enough? <laughs> I think so, it's pretty big. Okay, I think we can stop there. Okay, so where's the, where's the opening again? Uh, oh, I think I it's on you your side. I hope you didn't duct tape it close. Okay, no, we're good, we're good. So, so it's gonna inflate like this. Wait a minute, let's, let's, okay, let's make sure it works. <laughs> Is it working? Uh, kind of. I don't know if it's <laughs> flating. <laughs> okay, good. So it does inflate. It does hold air. Yeah. Right? So should we try it? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, so we're gonna use a hair dryer. <laughs> right? And now we wait. Oh. It's working. Kind right? of. Oh, yeah. Woohoo! Okay, it's almost inflated. All right. Okay, what do you think? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, on the count of three, we'll throw it, okay? Okay. All right. One, two, three. three. <laughs> it didn't quite. Not quite. It doesn't. Aw. Doesn't quite float. It's huh? still too so heavy, Phil. I think, think? we got a couple problems here. The duct tape is really heavy. Yep. Also, these bags themselves are really heavy. Okay, well, if we want to fix the duct tape uh, problem, uh, we could use lighter tape. Like, what if, haha, -ha, we use 
um, invisible tape, or as I like to call it, science tape. Science tape. Which would be lighter than duct tape. That's a good plan. But what do we do about the bags? Have you ever seen those, you know, those dry cleaning bags? Oh, that wait, I've got work. one. I've got one here. Cool. Perfect. Aha! Yeah, perfect. Because, you know, when I get my lab coats, dry clean. So let me see here. Oh, yeah, this is much lighter. This is kind of the same material as the, as the grocery store fruit bags, right? I have a better feeling about this one. So lighter tape, lighter bag means a much lighter balloon. OK, well, let's try it. First, I should probably take my lab coat out. This is water. Now, it's ice water. <laughs> science. OK, no, that's not the science part. Here's something you can do at home. Get some ice water and a way to time yourself and stick your hand in the ice water. It's a little hard to stick your hand in ice water for a long period of time because after a while, it starts to hurt. But don't worry, the pain that you're feeling isn't actually because you're damaging anything. It's just your body's way to tell you that you need to take your hand out of the cold water. Yeah, you usually can't do it for very long. But some animals, like seals and whales, they live in ice water all the time. They live in the Arctic, so how do they do it? One word, blubber. Blubber is a layer of fat that protects you from the cold, or protects a seal and a whale. We don't have blubber, but we are today going to have some blubber, because we're going to make a blubber glove. Blubber glove. I love saying that. Here's how we do it. First, we want blubber. OK, this isn't blubber. This is lard, which is actually animal fat. You can use lard. You can use margarine or butter or shortening, anything with a lot of fat in it. And remember, this is messy, so definitely get an adult to help you. So we've got our lard, and we need a bag. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a scoop full of lard, like this, and you're going to put it in the bag like so. Mm-hmm. Like that. There we go. And then you're going to start smoothing out the blubber or the lard like this. Because what you want to do is have a nice, thin layer all the way around. See? Starting to work? Yeah. Then seal the bag and tape the edges. Huh? A square of blubber. Then do it again. Here, I have two bags of blubber, and I've taped all the way around the outside. So I have <laughs> a blubber glove. Check it out. So let's try it out. I stick the blubber glove in the ice water. It's completely working. It is not even cold. The blubber is completely protecting my hand from the ice water. I'm not even remotely cold at all. That is very fun. So, try it yourself. A blubber glove. Now, how do we max out a blubber glove? <laughs> Watch. <laughs> water. Ice water. I know for a fact that I wouldn't last more than 10 seconds in here without my blubber suit. I'm going to make an entire outfit of blubber. I've got them in large plastic bags, and I'm going to get completely suited up in blubber with the help of Trevor and Stephanie. OK, guys, suit me up. It's very heavy. <laughs> Let's just go like this. Oh, OK. Time to cut back on the cookies. All right, let's do it. All right. Lover suit, go! <laughs> I can't. OK. OK, here we go. And... OK, so far. Oh. <laughs> the legs are warm. And... Oh. Blubber suit! Ha ha ha! I am in seals! Actually, here I am in the, in the ice, and I don't feel too bad. Blubber suit works! Ah! Blubber suit's refreshing, actually. You just sit back and chill out. Well, there you go. Blubber suit success. 
seals and whales are able to stay in ice water for their whole lives because they have protective layers of blubber just like I do. Okay, so now all I have to do is get out. <laughs> blubber suit! Oh no, my blubber is leaking. Ah, I've sprung a leak. My blubber, oh, my precious blubber. No, what a world. <laughs> oh, hey, how you doing? Ugh, shut the door, it's cold out there. Ugh. Cold enough for you, huh? Well, that's nothing. Let me tell you, you know what temperature water freezes at? Yeah, zero degrees Celsius. But even that is nothing. Let's say it's winter in Winnipeg. It could get down to minus 20, maybe even minus 40. But even that's nothing. Liquid nitrogen, minus 196 degrees Celsius. But even that's nothing. The vacuum of space. Minus 271 degrees Celsius. But even that's nothing. So, what's the coldest temperature? What? What's the coldest temperature you can have? It's called absolute zero. Minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, all the little wiggling that particles do comes to a stop. Everything is frozen. No more movement, no more energy. Everything stops. It doesn't get any colder than that. Absolute zero is the ultimate nothing. Brr, time to get your mittens on. Our first hot air balloon didn't float very well. It's huh? still so heavy, though. I think, think? we've got a couple problems here. So we're making a lighter version out of dry cleaning bags and science tape, both lighter materials than our last version. We also went for more of a square shape than our last version, which kind of looked like a sock. Once we were done assembling, we got the hair dryer and tried it again. Ooh, it's sort of working. Kind of. It's inflating. That's something. Yeah. Let's start. <laughs> it, feels, it feels warm, like the hair dryer is actually making a lot of warm air in there. Yeah. This is definitely working better than the last version because it's so much lighter. Yeah. Wait a minute. Almost got it. Oh. Yeah, it's sort of working, right? Cool. Kind of. <laughs> okay. Ready? Are we testing it? Turning off the hair dryer. Oh. Huh. It kind of collapses the moment we turn off the hair dryer. Not huh? what we expected, was it? Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, it sort of works. Oh. The thing is, our balloon is so big that we need to heat up all of the air that's in there. I don't know if this hair dryer is strong enough. I think you might be right. Um, mm. So we just need something else that pushes heat. Yeah, more um, heat. So more like power. a like a heater of some sort. Uh, you know, we've got some heaters up in this room actually, and maybe I could just tear one out. We can use that. I like it. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. There. Got it. An industrial heater. And this is going to work just the same as our hair dryer. It's going to blow a lot of hot air up here, but this is way more effective than a hair dryer, right? Yeah, way more powerful. So uh, we put the balloon over here, hot air comes up, the balloon inflates, and hopefully flies. Hopefully. All right, let's get the balloon. So we put the balloon on the heater and turned it on, but it doesn't seem like much is happening. That's because the heater pushes less air, but the air is much hotter, which means it took longer. Should we have brought a book? But soon it was inflating. Definitely a better result than the hair dryer. <laughs> okay, you ready? I think it's gonna work. It's gonna be awesome. All right. Yep. One, two, three, let go. Lift off. Yeah! It's like a giant jellyfish! That's huge! Uh oh, uh oh, it's tilting, it's tilting! No! No! Down. <laughs> okay, so the so the balloon flies, which is great. Awesome. Um, the problem is it turns over in the air. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed that. And if it turns upside down, then all the hot air comes out, and and it doesn't fly anymore. Aww. I was thinking next time if we if we make it bigger, what if we had a little weight at the bottom just to keep it stable? Oh yeah, okay. I've I've seen balloons that have sort of an X, like a very light wood that goes across the opening at the bottom. Oh, cool. Maybe we could tie a piece of rope to that to keep it weighted. And if the bottom is heavier, then it won't flip over upside down, right? Love that idea. Uh, so we're gonna weight it at the bottom with a little X so that it doesn't flip over. 
and we're gonna make a bigger balloon. <laughs> we're gonna need more bags. Oh, right, back to the bag store. Bag store! Okay. <laughs> Wait for me! Being a chef is my absolute passion, and cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Pika, and this is Cooking with Science. Strange. The spoon is no sharper than it was before. <laughs> oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker, and today we're cooking with coal. <laughs> today we're going to learn how to make a drink cool. Look at this bottle of lemonade. It's warm right now and not very refreshing. So what's the best way to cool this down? We put it in ice, right? But did you know there's an even better recipe than ice? You can make ice colder. It's true. All you need to do is add salt. I've got a second bowl of ice and a second jug of lemonade, and I've got two digital thermometers. What I'm going to do is add salt to this bowl. What the salt does is starts to melt the ice, and that actually consumes heat. This is called an endothermic reaction, and it absorbs heat, which makes the ice colder. And as you can see, this bowl of ice still sitting at around zero degrees Celsius, but this bowl, minus eight and falling. Wow. So there you have it, making something even colder than ice would normally make it. That is a way to make a refreshing glass of lemonade. I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on Cooking with Science. Oh. With our new heater and lighter materials, our hot air balloon was floating free. That is, until it tipped over. When that happens, all the hot air inside escapes. But Michaela and I have a solution. So we decided to build an even bigger hot air balloon and add a way to keep it upright. So the process aside from that is pretty much the same. We put the end over top of our industrial heater and I will plug it in. Hair dryer again for good measure. <laughs> it's working. It's inflating, but we gotta keep we gotta keep fluffing it up, otherwise it just sort of sags. But you can see the top of the balloon is is definitely working. It's a lot it's a lot bigger than the last one though. Do you think we made it too big, Michaela? <laughs> it's really big. I think it's working. It's definitely working. Uh oh, pull your side. Oh, oh it's totally working. <laughs> I'm so surprised that this works so well. So the stick is gonna keep it balance so the bottom faces down, but Michaela's gonna tie a string to the stick so that when it goes up, we can keep it centered. Okay, this looks good. You wanna let it go? Yeah, are we ready? Okay. Okay, three, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> yeah! So let's recap. The hotter air inside the balloon is less dense than the colder air on the outside. And because we were able to get the air hot enough and the balloon light enough, it floats. Science Max, experiments at large. Hot air balloon. Thank you, Michaela. Awesome. That was so cool. Wait a minute, who has the string? Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Dark suit. No way. Behold my giant balloon. <laughs> yeah, it's called app. It's called Absolute Zero. Please let it go. Oh, oh, oh. By the end of that, my hand is so cold. Wait, I can do this. I can do this. Science! <laughs> Free! Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! Today on Science Max, it's all about the power of water. I'll see you later. We filter it, pump it, paint with it, and most importantly, use it to crush stuff. Oh, crushing! <laughs> all on this episode of Science Max, experiments at large. Ha. 
Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large, and this is a syringe. You might know syringes from when you get a needle at the doctor, but syringes are used all the time in science because they let you measure very precise amounts of fluid. Now, check it out. You push the plunger down, and it comes out the top. Or you could pull the plunger in, and it would suck more fluid in this way. But check this out. I've got a syringe attached to a hose here, and this hose is filled with water. And I wondered, if the hose was really, really long, how hard would it be to push this plunger down? Of course, I don't know where the end of the hose is because it was really long and I had to string it all the way around, so. Ah, ha, 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 here it is. Okay, so let's find out. Push the syringe down and water will come out the other end of the hose. Pretty cool. You see, this is called hydraulics. Hydraulics is a branch of science that deals with fluids, fluids like water but hydraulics are also a mechanism used in a lot of machines. Check this out, this is a syringe with a short hose on it, much shorter this time, and I press down on the plunger of the syringe and water comes out. And I pull in on the syringe and water goes back in. Because the plunger is airtight, it allows me to push or pull the water. But what if I close the system and take another syringe and attach it to the end of the hose like this? Well, then, if I push this plunger in, this syringe fills up with water. And then I pull this plunger out, the syringe empties. So check it out, this plunger raises and lowers based on what I'm doing with this plunger. And you know what that means? We've made a remote control. Huh? Check it out. So, if you take two syringes, and you take a hose, and you attach them to something you want a remote control, voila, you can build something like this. We have made our very own robotic arm that you can power remotely with hydraulics. Pretty cool, right? If you want to build one of these yourself, here are the materials you need. First, you need two supports and the arm. I used pieces of wood, but you can use wooden spoons, rulers, or pencils. You'll need some craft sticks, elastics, and a paper plate. And of course, two syringes and a hose, which you can get in an art supply store or a hardware store. Here's how you build your own hydraulically powered arm. First, make the base by tracing holes for your supports the width of a craft stick apart. Cut out the holes and use a craft stick and elastic to secure the supports underneath the plate and on top. Then add some elastics and a piece of craft stick in the middle so the supports won't scrunch together. Because we are holding this whole thing together with elastics. Then get your syringe in there and keep it propped up with more elastics. Then get your arm and slot it in between the supports. The arm should be horizontal when the syringe is half full. Elastics to attach the arm and the syringe. Then push down on this end of the plunger and ha ha, you have a remote control robotic arm. You can also max it out even more by adding more degrees of movement. You can make the arm rotate side to side. You can even add a little claw attachment at the end and power it all using syringes. Ha <laughs> ha, science and hydraulics. So let's max it out. I just, I just need an expert to help me. Uh, let's see. And over in that way. Uh, oh, Chris from Logix Academy, of course. Logics Academy knows all about building robot stuff. I'm sure Chris can totally help me. Let's go. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, hey, Phil. Oh, hey, Chris from Logics Academy. Great to see you. What uh, took you so long? Uh, how long was I gone? And what's with the uh, orange lab coat? Oh, it happened again. It keeps changing the color of my lab coat. But this time, Chris, I prepared for it, and I wore another lab coat. <laughs> uh, See? Blue? No! Well, you know what? This is happening a lot, Chris. So, so I wore another lab coat <laughs> under this lab coat. I'm gonna have to wear a lot of lab coat stuff because this is happening all the time. We should talk about hydraulics, okay, right? Yes, yeah, because yes. we got some cool stuff planned. Okay, so we're just gonna get the table in here. Oh, oh, okay. This is the cool. hydraulic arm. Check it out. Oh, very cool, very cool. If we want to max it out, what can we do? We could make it bigger, if, we can make it What if we arm. did it so that the force you put on this side gets multiplied so that this side's even stronger? 
Ooh, what do you call that when that happens? A uh, force multiplier. A force, I like that. Force multiplier, it sounds like a video game. So we would have a lot more power. You have a lot more power, which Ooh. we could do fun stuff. Yeah, so if we had like lots of power, what would we do? We'd like crush something. Yeah, let, let's crush some stuff. Yeah, we could crush some stuff. Okay, can we start with syringes though? Yep, yep. And then we'll work up as we go. I like it. So what do we need? Do we need different sizes? So yeah, I was thinking we need a small a delicious plate of cheese and crackers, my favorite snack. But these crackers are pretty salty, so I should probably pour myself a glass of water first, huh? No! My cheese and crackers! Why? Why does this happen? Why does the water stick to the glass? Well, because of science. And the reason why it happens gets a little complicated, but it boils down to this one simple thing. Water likes to stick to things. Huh? Huh? Did you see? Did you see how it stuck? No, of course you didn't. You know why? Because it only sticks on a small scale. See those drops of water? That's water sticking to the surface. But it only works when the surface tension of the water is less than the force of gravity, which is why water drops fall when they get bigger. So it sticks to things. That still doesn't explain why you can pour water out of some containers without any drips, and other containers make it nearly impossible. <laughs> It's all about the angle. Water will flow very easily when there isn't a large change in direction, like around the curved top of this glass. But when there's a big change in direction, like at the mouth of this teapot, the water can't make that turn as easily. This is also why pouring from a full glass is much messier than one that's less full. Pouring out of a full glass, the water only needs to change direction this much to flow down the side. But from a half full glass, the water would need to change direction this much. So all this happens because water likes to stick to things. So let's do an experiment and coat this glass with hydrophobic spray. Now, hydrophobic coatings repel water. So if it's repelling the water from the outside of the glass, will we still have the same problem? Well, let's find out. Hydrophobic coated glass, non-hydrophobic coated glass, or just regular glass. Water likes to stick to surfaces, but it can't stick to one coated in hydrophobic coating. That's impressive. Should we try something else? Well, that's one way to solve the dribbling glass problem. Except you can't coat your glasses at home with hydrophobic coating because it's not good to eat. The secret is using a container that has a very sharp angle between where you're pouring the water and the underside of the glass, like this jug. And there you go. Now I can enjoy a nice glass of water with my cheese and crackers. Uh, oh, right, I am. Um, wait, hold on, I can re, I will remake the crackers into, see, look, see, it's just, it's fine. It's fine, I'm not really gonna eat that, I'm just kidding. Chris and I are maxing out our hydraulic crusher. Yes, yes, before we get to that, I have a little game I wanna play. Okay, great. Great, you can pick either the small one. The big one. The, okay. <laughs> so what's the game? Simple thumb war, uh, I'm gonna press down this side, you press down that side, we'll see you win. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Oh, wow, that was really tough. Why was that so hard? Well, Phil, I'm just really strong. Wait a minute, my turn. Okay, one, two, three, go. Yeah, ah. see, pushing down on this one is way easier. You wouldn't it think is. that the small syringe would be easier. Why is that? The reason for it is, is that you have to push this one down a lot farther than you have to push this one okay, down. Let's see. see. See how oh, far yeah. this one goes, and this one's barely This one moving. travels much more. This is how we can exchange a little bit of force over a long distance. That's right. To a, a little bit of distance at a lot of force. That's exactly right. Just like the lever, it's a mechanical advantage. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's hydraulic advantage. That's right. Chris and I push down on small syringes, which gives us more force on our larger syringes. Our crusher was ready to go. Ooh, how about an orange? One, two, three. We squeeze down and... Oh! Oh! <laughs> then we tried a walnut. Are you allergic to nuts? I am not. One, two, three. Oh! Oh! When we tried a golf ball, we reached the limit of what our plastic syringes and our hands could do. We need to come up with a stronger, more awesome crushing machine using hydraulics. That's right, I have some ideas. Okay, good, we can go to, we can use metal. We can use metal. And we can, and use... we can go bigger as well. <laughs> Ew, this water is gross, but I'm gonna drink this water. Why? Well, because of science. No, but I'm not gonna drink the water like this. First, I'm gonna use the power of science to help me clean it. How? By using gravel. Gravel, yes, 
gravel. So, say I've got some dirty water, and there are particles floating in that water. Large particles, your rocks, your wood, these styrofoam bits will act as the large particles. You pour it into the gravel, and the large particles get filtered out. See? Nothing but clean, clean water. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, Phil. That's not really clean yet. That's because we haven't done step two. Sand. Sand? Yes, sand. Let's say that these plastic beads are small particles. That filters out the tinier stuff. There, huh? Clean, right? Uh, no, it's not very clean. So we filter the water in the next step with charcoal. What? Charcoal? Yes, charcoal. Charcoal works just like gravel and sand, except on a microscopic scale. Say these bits are tiny particles you can't even see. The charcoal catches these like the sand and gravel caught the larger particles. This is called a gravel, sand, and charcoal filter. The gravel catches the big particles, the sand the smaller ones, and the charcoal the microscopic ones. These kinds of filters are used all over the world to clean drinking water. Ah. Delicious. Science. Max Historica. This is Archimedes. What? Who said that? Uh, it's me, the narrator. We're doing a segment. Oh, well. I was working. Don't sneak up on a guy like that. Uh, <clears throat> this is Archimedes, an ancient inventor and one of the greatest scientific minds ever. Ooh. <laughs> one of his famous inventions was the Archimedes screw. Ooh, um, uh, mm. ah. <laughs> Which was used to make holes in wood. No, that's not what it's for. It's, it's for water. Uh, right. Used to make holes in water. What, what, what? No! Look, did you even do your homework? I, um... Hold on. It's, uh... Yeah. It's, here, it's here somewhere. Uh, um, look, I'll just show you. You see, in ancient times, we had many uses for something that could lift water up from a well or to take lake water uh, from uh, the lake and put it into a farmer's field and that sort of thing. Ah, okay, I've got it from here. So, Archimedes invented a screw and he drilled a hole in the side of that container. No, no, no. Uh, look, just just sit down oh, oh, and I'll, I'll explain it, okay? I am sitting, I'm in a voiceover booth. Good for you, now be quiet, now look. What you do is you put the screw in the water like this, and then you want to raise the water higher, you see? And so turn it around like so, and the water fills each gap in the screw, and it starts to come up. It gets to the top, and look at this. Look, we've got water coming at the top there. The water is being pumped up. It is the first water pump. I see. Still seems like a lot of work to fill a glass, but it's very cute. No, we made them bigger. We obviously were not going to make them this big. This is not very useful. Uh, right, yeah, Archimedes, one of the greatest scientific minds ever. <sighs> Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. We tried one out of plastic, but now it's time to make one out of metal. These are called hydraulic cylinders, and they work the same as our syringes. Small ones on this side with a lot of travel, and then a larger one on this side to multiply the force. And some mechanical advantage with a lever to help us push even harder. We tried crushing a watermelon, and it worked great. So what else do we want to crush? We crushed a coconut. It's cracking. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh it's gonna leak. And then a can of pop. Whoa! Science Max Cola, now in the new smaller can. Let's really challenge this press. Ha ha, perfect. Ha ha, a piece of wood. We tried to crush the wood, but we weren't able to get it to budge. So it's time to max it out even more. I think we're gonna need like a multi-story industrial sized hydraulic press. You know where we can get one of those? I do. Awesome. This is Water. Things float on water, like pool noodles and wood and toy boats. And now we're going to do an experiment with how paint floats on water. How's this supposed to work again? Oh! 
I'm supposed to take the paint out of the can first. This is a fun experiment you can do at home. All you need is a container, some water, and paint. But not just any paint, special paint you use for hydro dipping. That's hydro, meaning water, and dipping, meaning uh, dipping. Carefully pour the paint on the water and add a few different colors. Then take a stick to swirl it up into a pattern. Then you get something you want to paint and you carefully put it in like so. But don't pull it out as soon as you get it in. You have to spread the paint away because it'll stick when you bring it back out. And then when you pull it out, whoa! Hydro dip. Let that dry and then you have a very cool painted toy. Let's do some other stuff. This is a bike helmet. If you put tape on what you're painting, you can remove it later to make parts that aren't painted. Skateboard! Whoa! <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Now to max it out. Hydro dip pants! Wearing the pants when you do this is super messy and not something you should try at home. But the results weren't bad. <laughs> Science pants! Science pants! Science pants. One of the ways you can experience the power of water is watching it wash away dirt. You can experiment with this yourself by making your own erosion table. To make your own, fill a plastic tub with sand and tilt it up. Cut a hole in the tub at the low end and put a hose with a trickle of water at the high end. Then to complete your model, fill it with a little happy town. This small model shows how rivers cut their course to the ocean by following the lowest point. Try to design your town and the layout of the ground so the river goes around the buildings. I'll see you later. I'm gonna take a swim in the river now. There are lots of ways to experiment. Change the amount of water or the steepness of the angle. Look at the soil, it's all getting eroded over here. Or the way the town is laid out. Every time you do it, the river goes in a different direction. And have fun. Oh, phew, I'm, I'm tired, I'm just gonna lie down. And that is the power of water. Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. What about this? Is this what we're gonna use? We went to the Natural Resource Canada's CanMet Materials Laboratory, which is a federal research lab. Oh, this is good. Oh, look at that! Oh, can, is this what we're using? I uh, know. Oh, oh I can use this. Hold on, I let know. me figure this out. Maybe, maybe later. What, really? It's, it's just over here. CMAT is the largest research center in Canada dedicated to metals and materials research. Oh, this is it. This oh, is yeah, it. all right! Hydraulic press. How much force does this apply? This can do two million pounds. That's over 900,000 kilograms. Which is about 20 cars. <laughs> Let's crush some stuff! Some stuff. Oh, crushing! We gotta get the stuff. We gotta get the stuff. Okay. We started out with the piece of wood which defeated our last press. And go! Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I love that sound. Reversing. It turned our wood into a pancake. Whoa, totally flattened. So it was time to try some other stuff. We crushed a ball of plasticine. <laughs> oh, that, so cool. <laughs> that is neat. You sort of made a rainbow. Yeah. Aluminum foil. Aluminum foil. Yes, it is now a solid plate of aluminum. <laughs> and a basketball. Basketball. Good thing we, we got these earplugs in because when it pops, it'll be loud. What? Never mind. <laughs> oh, <whoa. laughs> this hydraulic press was so maxed out, we had to think of the toughest stuff to crush. We crushed hockey pucks, a safe, <laughs> we crushed a hydraulic jack with the hydraulic press. Whoa. This is a metal vice. Hard, strong. Yeah, steel. Heavy steel. Whoa, look at it bend. Ha, 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 ha. 
It totally exploded. <laughs> Science facts, experiments at large, hydraulics. Whoa. Nicely done. So fun. I should reverse it and we should start cleaning all that stuff up, yeah, huh? I think so. Okay, reverse. Oh. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Wait a minute, I didn't think this through. Do you have anything? I have a coconut. <laughs> I'm supposed to take the baby cup first. And there you go. Perfectly clean filtered water. <laughs> what cheese and cracker soup? Okay. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. This episode of Science Max is all about storing energy and releasing it. Yeah, let's try it out for real. Storing it in a giant spool racer, plus a domino chain reaction, mouse trap chain reaction, popsicle stick chain reaction, and more. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. <laughs> okay, three, two, one, go. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. Wow, I really need some more energy. Fortunately, I have some saved up. Ah, that's better. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Storing energy like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you can store energy, and that's what this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large is all about. In fact, I'm gonna store some energy in this container simply by putting it up here on the top shelf. More on that later. But right now, let's look at another way that you can store energy and release it in a really fun way. We're gonna make a spool racer, and it's pretty simple. Here's all you need. You need some science ribbon. Now, if you don't have science ribbon, you can use regular ribbon, but the ribbon really isn't important. It's the spool that's important. You'll also need a washer, elastics, pencil or pencil crayon, popsicle or craft stick, and science tape. Science tape is the same as invisible tape, except I use this one only for science. Here's how you build it. Break the popsicle stick so it's smaller than the diameter of the spool. Then put the elastics on top of the pencil and pull them tight, thread the popsicle stick through, and feed it all through the hole of the spool. Grab the elastics on the other side and pull out the pencil and everything will be threaded perfectly. Then stick on the washer and thread the pencil through. Finally, tape the popsicle stick down so it doesn't move. And if any of these steps are a little too fast, don't worry. All of the instructions are up on the website. That was cool. I, uh, I, can't, I can't make it go away. I can only make it come up. So there you go, a spool racer. And here's how it works. You spin the pencil around, and that twists the elastic. Now that elastic is going to want to unwind, right? So just keep spinning that pencil around until it's good and tight. And then when you put it on the ground, the pencil's gonna wanna unwind, but it can't because the table's in the way now, which means that the energy is gonna transfer to the spool, which is gonna turn, whoa, and it's gonna drive away. Yeah, let's try it out for real. So why does this work? It works because the elastic is coiled, right? Yes, and because I'm putting in the energy to twist it. You see, I'm putting in effort to spin this pencil crayon around, and then when I've finished, all of my effort has been stored in the elastic. When I let it go, my energy transfers into movement. So that's, uh-oh. That's what we're gonna do today, Science Maximites. We're gonna max out the spool racer. I think Anthony would really know how to help me with this. So, I'm off to the Ontario Science Center. Come on. Phil! Phil! What happened? Phil! What happened? Are you okay? Anthony! Yeah, hi. Oh, were you, in, were you in the middle of something? I don't worry about it, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. You know what, I was wondering if I could get your, your help with something. Sure, yeah. Yeah, one word. 
Spool racer. Actually, actually, that's two words. Spool, yeah. spool yeah. racer. That's yeah. Cool. You want to help me max out a giant spool racer? Uh, yeah. Awesome. Let's go back to Science Matt headquarters. Okay, Anthony. Today, I want to max out the spool racer. Awesome. Right? So you twist up the elastic, and it goes from potential energy, all stored, to kinetic. Kinetic energy. Whoa. There we go. That's awesome. So okay. not too hard to design. Should be fairly easy to yeah, max really out. Yeah, really simple couple of parts here. We just got elastic band inside, Yep. and then this big, long pencil to store the energy and then release it. And the most important part ah, is spool. Is the spool. Exactly. And I know where we should start. Where's that? Right here. This is an industrial uh -huh. cable spool. So the big, thick electrical cables, they come wound on this thing. Yeah, OK. So that figure. We Whoa. start with this. Got right? it. And the good news is that it's got a hole already. And check it out. It rolls. It rolls really well, right? Uh-huh. OK, cool. Uh -huh. OK, OK. So uh, guess... bungee cord yep. and long pole or something. Yeah. And uh, we're ready to go. I guess let's get some parts. OK. OK. Oh, hey, how you doing? Y you want to buy something? I got a lot of stuff here. And I got a special today only. Potential energy, huh? I will throw in some potential energy with any order. You see this stuff on the shelves here? The stuff on the higher shelves has more potential energy than the stuff on the lower shelves. Don't believe me? Here, hold on, hold on. Look at this state-of-the-art traffic controller. Right now, it's sitting up here on this high shelf. Now, if it were to fall, it would be going fast, which means it would have a lot of kinetic energy. <laughs> you see, when it fell down, it had enough kinetic energy to completely break itself apart. Um, yeah. Well, that's the difference between mm, potential energy and kinetic energy. Look at this bagel, just sitting here, not moving, minding its own business on top of this ramp. It's all potential energy and no kinetic energy. And when it gets to the floor, it's all kinetic energy and no potential energy. <laughs> and now it has neither because it's on the floor and it's not moving. <laughs> Five second rule. And now you know your energy. So what do you say? You want this thing? Uh, tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a discount because, because you know it's it's gently used. Hey, I'll even throw in this bagel, huh? Also gently used. Anthony and I are maxing out the spool racer. We start with a long coil of bungee cord, which is kind of like a giant elastic, and feed it through the spool. Then we put on a big piece of plastic to act as our washer and use a long pole as the pencil. We flip the spool on its side to wind it up. Then we flip it back and it's ready to go. All right, so we have it all wound up and we're ready to try it again, but with one change. Uh, Phil. Yeah. What's with the trike? I ride the trike. It's like I always say, what's the point of building something big if I can't ride it? There's no way you're gonna fit on this thing. No, no, I don't I don't put my feet on the pedals. I put my feet here on the back, right? And okay, then, yeah, and I then, get it, I get it. You got it? Uh, hold, hold on, I gotta do my helmet up. Safety first. You ready? I'm on it. Okay, three, two, one, go. Oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> Amazing. All the stored energy in the bungee cord is being released and the spool starts to turn. There's even enough energy that I can get pulled along behind it. It's not going that fast, no, though. And it's... it's pretty good, though. It still pulls me. Right? Yeah, pretty good. So, spool racer actually able to get pulled by it. Yeah. You know what? I think we can go even bigger. Bigger? Yes. Well, what did you have in mind? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> what is this? What this you... is an industrial cable spool, and this is the biggest size that they make. <laughs> and I thought we would do the same thing with this. What do you think? I think this could generate a huge amount of energy. OK, so all we got to do is just build it just like we built that other one. Just bigger. Except way bigger. Let's do it. <laughs> wow. 
When you set a domino on its end, you're giving it potential energy because it can fall. Ooh, and when you put two dominoes together, you can start a chain reaction because that one will fall into that one. Ah, but it's a lot more fun with more dominoes. Setting up a run of dominoes is a lot of fun, but it takes a flat surface and a steady hand. And if you want to do it yourself, add gaps, so if one part falls, it doesn't take out the whole run. Last one. There. I had some dominoes left, but I did it. I made the Science Max logo. See? Science right? Max. Sort of. Let's see how it works. Ready? Yeah! <laughs> now it's time to max it out! Giant maxed out dominoes! Woohoo! Even though these dominoes are giant, they're still gonna work the same. They're standing up on their ends, which means they've got some potential energy. And when I give this one a push, that potential is gonna turn into kinetic energy and it's gonna knock the next one and the next one and the next one. I, I hope. We, I don't know what's gonna happen, but let's find out. You ready? Okay, three, two, one. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Giant dominoes! Yeah, science! The problem is, when you use dominoes this big, setting them up again is a real chore. <sighs> This is a mouse trap, but don't worry, no mice are gonna be harmed in the making of this episode. Mouse traps are a great example of stored energy. You see, in order to set a mouse trap, you have to push this bar back, and it's hard to do because the spring holds it. And then you set the mouse trap by putting this little lever underneath this very sensitive trigger, and once you have it set, all that energy is stored as potential energy but it'll go off with just the slightest touch, releasing the energy. So what if I had a number of mouse traps and they're all set and all of that potential energy is stored up and I dropped a number of ping pong balls on them? Well, then I could set off a chain reaction where one mouse trap flies and hits another mouse trap that hits a ping pong ball and then they all go. Now this is something you can try at home, but do not set the mouse traps yourself. It can really hurt if it snaps on your fingers, so you should probably ask an adult to help you, and then you can see how brave the adults in your house are. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Mouse trap, chain reaction! <laughs> and last one, there we go. And now, let's max this out. Let's do it with 90 mouse traps. And this is a crate of ping pong balls. So let's see what happens when we put them together. Maxed out ping pong ball mouse trap chain reaction. <sighs> awesome. Ready? I'm on it. Anthony and I have built a large okay, spool three. racer. Oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked so well, the only option was to go bigger. What is this? this is an industrial cable spool, and this is the biggest size that they make. I think this could generate a huge amount of energy. Huge... Building our giant spool racer is the same process as the other builds. So the steps are exactly the same, but on a larger scale. And this time, we're gonna use, obviously, the large spool, and we're gonna use this two by four as our pencil windy thing. Coil some bungee cord, feed it through. Ready? Yep. Okay, here it comes. Ah, there we go. Got it? 
<laughs> yeah. Add a washer and a long two by four to act as our pencil. And now we stick the giant two by four inside the coil. Just about. Yeah, we got it. There okay, we cool. go. And we're ready to try it out. So it looks like we're ready to go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do you want to do it in here or you want to do it outside? Oh, definitely outside. Okay, let's go. Yeah, okay, cool. Yep. Oh, it's heavy. Right. Batteries are great at storing energy. They store electricity. Batteries? But if you're like me and you have a whole bunch of batteries and you don't remember which are the good ones and which are the dead ones, there's a trick that you can use to find out. Get a frying pan or a brick or a concrete floor or something else that's very, very hard and an adult's permission. Here's the secret. Dead batteries will bounce and batteries that still have some life in them won't. Watch. Good battery. Dead battery. Now, it's a little hard to see, but listen. One hit. Two hits. Here's what's going on. See, batteries store electricity in the form of a gel, sort of like modeling clay. This is modeling clay, fresh from the fields, where the pit, the pits, the mine, wherever modeling clay comes from. And this is modeling clay I've left out for about five days, so it's all dried up and hard. Now, when modeling clay is new, it's all wet and soft. And when you drop it, it doesn't bounce very well. I've left this piece of modeling clay out to dry for about five days. Now it's all dried up and old and it bounces. New, old. So, same thing with battery. Good batteries won't bounce and bad batteries will. Science. Here's a fun chain reaction you can do. Popsicles are craft sticks, because these are a little bit wider than popsicle sticks. It, it is because these kind of sticks are slightly bendy, and when you bend them and put them together in a pattern in a certain way, you can keep them under tension, and then they want to snap back, and then they'll fly. So here's how you make the pattern. Ready? You take a popsicle stick, or a craft stick, and you put it down on the table. I know, okay, it's a slow start. Then we take another one and put it across. Now comes the secret. The secret is over and then under. You want to put it over one and then under another, like that. And then this one over, under. Put it over the one that looks like it's the top stick and under the stick that looks like it's the bottom stick. And then it starts to hold tension. It starts to hold the potential energy. Continue this pattern. Each stick goes over and under the two sticks at the end. Now here's the trick. Soon as this one lets go, then that one will let go, then that one, then that one, then that one, and that's how you get the chain reaction. They all start flying up. So you have to build it with never letting go of that last stick. You gotta always remember to keep a hand on it or else you'll have to start again. So, okay, so you ready? You wanna see me let it go? Here we go. I know, that isn't so great because it's better if it's a longer chain. So fortunately, I have a longer chain. I've got a binder clip on this end keeping the craft sticks together. Ready? Three, two, one. Wow! Release of kinetic energy from the potential energy of winding all the craft sticks together. Fun, and you can totally do it at home. Now, let's max it out. Behold, almost 800 craft sticks in a long, nicely designed triangle. Ready? Two, one. I'm gonna go get something to clean this all up with. All right. So Anthony and I have built a giant spool racer and have taken it outside to try it out. In order to wind it up, we flipped over the last version on its side. But this spool weighs 200 kilograms. Easy to roll, almost impossible to flip over. Uh, uh, 
Come on, get it. I don't think it's gonna work. It's too heavy to move. Yeah. We should have thought of that before. Well, I'm sure we'll think of something. Uh... So Anthony and I thought about it. <laughs> and thought about it. <sighs> and thought about it. I got it! What? No. No. But you... And the answer finally dawned. What if we roll it this way? Because then that would wind it up, right? That's brilliant! By rolling it backwards, we wind up the bungee cord in one direction, which will make it want to unwind in the other direction. Anthony and I roll it across the parking lot to get it wound up tight. I don't think I'm gonna hold it anymore. Okay, okay. Let go. Uh, okay, okay, it's wedged. It worked. All right, one more thing. We're gonna hook the trike up to this one as well. Okay. Okay. So right now, it's all wound up, and when it gets moving, that potential energy in the coil will turn into kinetic. Exactly. Kinetic energy. Now, just in case you're tempted to try this at home, I need to tell you, do not try this at home. We're trained professionals, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Well, as much as anybody can be trained for this, because no one uh. really does this. Are you ready? Ready! Okay, here we go! Oh! <laughs> it's working! It's working! Yeah! Sure enough, all the potential energy we stored in the bungee cords starts to unwind, which rolls the spool and pulls me along behind it. What's more, that big heavy spool has a lot of momentum. Yeah. So when it gets going fast, it just wants to keep moving. It wasn't long before I had to jump off. Uh oh! of kinetic energy. That was a ton of kinetic energy. There you go, Science Max, experiments at large, massive spool racer. Your turn next? Yeah! Okay. <laughs> so that's what we're gonna do today, Science Maximites. Whoa! <laughs> we are going to learn how to juggle. I can't hear you, I've got dominoes in my ears. And you put it in, and whoa, and now it's all broken. Well, here's a trick to let that, that, here's the trick. It's me disappearing. <laughs> you see? When it would, when it would. <laughs> Looper reel? Looper reel. Okay, okay. hi. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! Today on Science Max, we're looking at... Chemicals! 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 Chemicals make up everything around us, and we're finding out which ones you can mix together to make spectacular science. Whoa! Woo! Cutest science ever. Today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil McCordick, and the name of the show is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're taking a closer look at chemistry. Ooh. Chemistry is the science of atoms and molecules, the things that make up all matter, and how they interact with each other. Take, for example, this glow stick. Actually, don't take it, because I, I, I kind of need it. The glow stick doesn't glow until you, um, the glow stick doesn't glow until you break the barrier and mix the two chemicals and they start to glow. Huh? Pretty cool, huh? Chemistry. Now the chemical reaction we're looking at today is the old vinegar and baking soda volcano. But this reaction doesn't have anything to do with volcanoes. It's chemistry. Now, this experiment is totally safe, but I do recommend you get an adult's permission before you do it, because it's very messy. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> First, you're gonna want baking soda and vinegar. These are your two main ingredients, but you'll also want dish soap and red food coloring if you want it to look a little bit more like lava. Now, I like to mix the baking soda, red food coloring, and dish soap together with a little warm water, so all you have to do is add the vinegar. And when you do, this is what happens. And there you go, chemical reaction. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how much vinegar or baking soda do I use? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. This is where you can be science maximites. Try different amounts. More vinegar, more baking soda, more dish soap, who knows? Write down the amounts each time you use it and find out what amounts work best. That's called science. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today, chemistry in all its forms. And of course, because it is Science Max, experiments at large, we're going to max out the vinegar and baking soda volcano. So I'm off to the Center for Skills Development and Training. Come on. Hey, Talina. Hi, Phil. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. This is Talina. She's going for her PhD in chemistry from McMaster, right? Yep. Awesome, which means you can help me max out the baking soda and vinegar. We need vinegar. You grab that vinegar and vinegar volcano. So what happens when we mix these two chemicals? Well, vinegar is an acid and baking soda is a base, and when you mix them, they neutralize each other to produce carbon dioxide and water as a byproduct. Hmm, so acids and bases are kind of like opposites. Yep. So I guess that makes sense. When you put them together, crazy stuff happens. Yeah. Awesome, chemistry. Okay, so I want to use this much vinegar and this much baking soda. What's with the fish tank? The fish tank is where I want to mix it all together. What do you think? Awesome. Maxed out. Okay, uh, let's move the fish tank somewhere where we won't make a huge mess. It's a little heavy with all that. We get it. Uh, no, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to take a couple trips. That's kind of heavy. Okay, so we'll take this and that, and then this and then and that. No, hold on. I can do it. One, one more. Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I took too much. I took too much. Uh oh. Uh oh. That's good, Ramona. Put it in the. Put it in the background. Put the sign in the background. Yeah, in the BG. I love the BG. Chemicals, 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 chemicals. What are chemicals? Are they things you have in a lab in a jar that say chemical on them? Well, yes, but if that's all you think chemicals are, then you need to know your chemicals. Turns out the stuff in the jar is a chemical, but the jar itself also made of chemicals. The table I'm putting it on. Made of chemicals. My lunch? Chemicals. Roller skate? Chemicals. My jacket? Chemicals. This guitar? Chemicals. My shoe? Chemicals. This watch? Chemicals. This fish? Chemicals. 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 Me? Chemicals. You? Chemicals. Ramona? Chemicals. No, I said you're chemicals. Chem- never mind. This is it. The periodic table of the elements. All matter in the universe is made up of these pure elements. They go together in different ways to make up everything. All matter. Think of it like building blocks. These little atoms are some of the elements on this periodic table. You got one oxygen, two hydrogen, bam, you got a water molecule. One carbon, two oxygen, hey, it's carbon dioxide. Two carbon, two oxygen, four hydrogen, skadoosh, vinegar. One sodium, one chlorine, hey, that's salt. All matter in the universe is just the stuff on here combining into these. And now, you know your chemicals. Mmm, sugar. Let's take a closer look at what's going on when we mix vinegar and baking soda. All chemicals are made of atoms. There's only four types in our reaction. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and sodium. When they go together like this, this is a molecule of vinegar or acetic acid. 
And this is a molecule of baking soda, or sodium bicarbonate. When chemicals react, they switch atoms. That one goes there, this one goes over here, and then this one turns into this, and then what you end up with are new molecules. This one is called sodium acetate, and this one is carbon dioxide gas, the gas you breathe out. And do you recognize this one? Right, water, H2O. Why all this happens gets complicated, but the study of chemistry is all about how molecules are built and react with other molecules. All right, Talina, you ready? Yep. You're gonna pour all your baking soda in the fish tank, and I'm gonna pour the vinegar into this bucket, because you don't wanna, don't wanna pour them together right away. Okay, you ready? Yep. Okay, go for it. When you're doing your PhD in chemistry, do you get to do stuff like this? Yeah. Really? Got to do a lot of fun reactions in the lab. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> have you ever done this much vinegar and baking soda in one time? I can't say I ever have. There you go, that's what I like to hear. I already put the soap in the bucket so it would mix with the vinegar when I poured it in. Are you done your baking soda already? I am. I'll pour faster. <laughs> oh, faster. It smells vinegary. It smells vinegar. It makes me want french fries. <laughs> okay, Talina, you take this very full bucket of vinegar and dish soap. Thank you. I will take this one. Uh-oh, we still have our third bucket. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll do these both at the same time. Okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Whoa! 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 Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. So the one thing it didn't do, it didn't shoot up in the air though. Yeah, it's because the top is quite open. So you would need to constrict it to get it to shoot up. Oh yeah, because we're using just sort of a square, mm -hmm. a rectangular prism container. We should get something that's maybe something more like our vinegar bottle, right? Because yeah. there's lots of space down here, but then it forces it into a tighter opening at the top there. Um, like a volcano. Yeah. And what else can we do uh, to make it even more powerful, max it out? Vinegar is only 5% acid, the rest is water, so you could try using 100%. So what kind of acid is vinegar? It's acetic acid. So vinegar is actually only 5% acetic acid yep. and 95% water. So you can get 100% acetic acid? Yeah. Can you get 100% acetic acid? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Why don't we get a container that's sort of shaped like a funnel, like mm -hmm. a volcano, yeah. and 100% acetic acid, and we'll do it again. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. Our vinegar and baking soda reaction went pretty well. But now we're gonna try it with a much stronger type of the same kind of acid you find in vinegar. Carefully putting this down. And watch out for the baking soda. You never know when it'll get out. And, well, I guess that's just baking soda, huh? Yeah, that's pretty safe. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so this is Baking Soda Vinegar Volcano version two. We have this differently shaped glass. What do you call this again? That's an Erlenmeyer flask. Why is it called that? It's actually named after a scientist. Did he look like that? Was he sort of shaped like this? No. No? Was he just a good chemist? Good scientist, and I think he designed the glass. Oh, see, there you go. So if you want to have a glass named after you, be a good chemist and design a <laughs> glass. I want to make a fill beaker. So this is 100% acetic acid. Yep. And what's the difference between this and vinegar? Vinegar has 5% of this and 95% water. But this is 100%, so it's much stronger. Much stronger. Can you put this on your french fries? No, I wouldn't be putting it on your french fries. No? As chemicals go, how dangerous is this? It's not too dangerous, but you definitely don't want to be breathing it in, and you don't want to be eating it. Or getting it on your skin. That's why I'm wearing these fancy pantsy gloves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour the acetic acid in this. What's this called? That is a graduated cylinder. Because it finished school. <laughs> so it graduated. Now you're gonna mix water and food coloring and soap all together yep. and pour it into there? It'll help dissolve some of the baking soda, so hopefully it'll react better with the acid. Sounds good. Face protection. Oh. All right, that's good. And now, when we do it, I wanna add the funnel at the end to like accentuate the concentration of, but I don't know if it's gonna go so fast that I won't be able to get it in there, but we'll try it. Let's try it. Vinegar baking soda volcano version two. Oh. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Good thing you got the mask. It smells a lot like vinegar. It's really strong. Oh. <laughs> 
That was pretty good. But what, what can we do to make it even bigger? Well, you could try using a different chemical reaction. Ooh, okay. Like what? The decomposition of hydrogen peroxide produces oxygen gas, and so that one's pretty vigorous if you use a catalyst. So we want something that makes a lot of gas so that it makes a lot of bubbles when you put the soap in it. Yep. Great, let's do it. And the sooner you leave that smell, the better, I think, for my, for my taste. Today, we're combining two different chemicals to create a reaction. Sometimes chemicals can combine in a way that makes them very different from how they started out. For example, this is sodium, or Na, on the periodic table. Now, the sodium tablets are in mineral oil because sodium reacts very strongly with water, even the water in the air, or especially the water in my skin. Watch what happens when I drop a sodium tablet into this beaker of water. Very cool and very dangerous. And this is chlorine, or Cl, on the periodic table. Chlorine gas is very poisonous. So, <clears throat> so what happens if we combine these two deadly substances? Do we create some sort of super poison? Something more deadly than anything else known to science that causes fear and chaos in chemistry labs all over the land? No, we create salt. Good old normal table salt. These two substances combine to make NaCl. Salt, something completely and totally safe. Chemistry. Oh. Oh. We've gone from vinegar and baking soda to 100% acetic acid in baking soda, and now we're doing the vinegar and baking soda volcano version three. No longer vinegar and baking soda. No. Nope. What are we using this time? So here we have some hydrogen peroxide. Oh, that's the stuff you use at home to put on a cut, right? Yeah, but the stuff at home is only 3%. This one's 30. So much, much stronger. Much 10 times stronger. Yes. And is this more dangerous? It's definitely corrosive, so wear your gloves. Corrosive means it could eat your skin. It can burn your skin a little Which bit. is why we are wearing gloves and blast shield. What's gonna mix with this? So here we have some potassium iodide, which is a salt, mm -hmm. and it's mixed in with some water. The most important part of this reaction is the fact that it creates gas. Oxygen Which gas? makes bubbles when you put in dish soap, right? Yep. So one big squirt of dish soap like that. Mix it up. Now we go over to the blast zone. That's plenty. All right. Oh. <laughs> now that's a reaction. It looks like there's steam coming off here. Why is that happening? Well, it is an exothermic reaction, so heat is being generated as the reaction proceeds. Oh, cool. Can we lift our visors now? Yep. Awesome. And what's being released? What's the gas that's coming off here? So it's oxygen gas that's being produced. Oxygen. Ah. <sighs> what we want to do is make this even bigger, but first, can we do it again? Sure. Because I have an idea. Hold on. <laughs> I think we should repurpose our old volcano. What do you think? Sounds like a good idea. OK, so if we put it over here. All right, volcano version 3.5. <laughs> Hydrogen peroxide, potassium iodide. Right, here we go. Whoa! Looks like lava. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that. That, now that is a big volcano eruption. Just covered the town. That is completely, yes. That town is going to be very clean because it's all soap bubbles. It's the cleanest volcano this side of Science Maxville. So I still think we can do this bigger, though, right? I agree. Um, oh, I know. What if we use some sort of uh, a tube, like, like, like maybe one of these, right? And then we attach it to uh, like an air compressor. I think you'd get some height. Yeah, and we go outside. The atom in 60 seconds. The atom is the smallest unit in a chemical element. 
atoms are made of three parts. Part number one are these guys, protons. They have a positive charge. The number of protons determines the element. One is hydrogen, two is helium, three is lithium, and so on. The protons sit in the middle here, which is called the nucleus. They sit in here with part number two, these guys. They're neutrons and they have a neutral charge. Now I've got eight protons and eight neutrons in this nucleus, making this an atom of oxygen. Orbiting around the nucleus are these tiny guys. They're electrons and they have a negative charge. I will demonstrate using kittens. Kittens are perfect because just like electrons, kittens are really small. And just like electrons, kittens move around randomly. You never know where they're going to be, but an oxygen atom should have eight kittens, or uh, electrons, somewhere inside. These kittens are constantly escaping, but guess what? That happens with electrons too. There you go, the atom, a nucleus of protons and neutrons surrounded by randomly moving electrons. Cutest science ever. How do you guys feel? Did you learn something? Huh? Pause up, who learned something? Hmm? Talina and I have made a bunch of chemical reactions, but in our quest to max things out, we've got a new plan. Whoa. Hydrogen peroxide and potassium iodide create gas. One way to max out the reaction is to contain the gas in something like a tube. We're gonna put the hydrogen peroxide in the tube first. Then we're gonna put in the potassium iodide in the top through a one-way valve. Then we're gonna pressurize the container. When it finally reacts, it will shoot up through the valve and we'll see how high we can get our stream of bubbles to go. But be warned, capping anything and not letting it escape is never a good idea. So we've got a release valve to make sure things work out. This is one of those experiments that's definitely on the list of don't try this at home. Vinegar baking soda volcano version four. Hydrogen peroxide, potassium iodide. And what we're gonna do this time is we're gonna put it in this tube. Hydrogen peroxide goes in here. And we've got, Talina, do you have the potassium iodide and syringes? Yeah, two syringes full. Two syringes full. About there is good. And then soap. Good amount of soap in there. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna close this off and tighten it up. And then we're gonna pressurize the whole system. And then we're gonna add the potassium iodide and it's going to be Spectacular, we hope. Okay, that's on tight. This is all good, putting this down here. And potassium iodide goes in here. Ready? Puts down, ready? One, two, three, go. And we back away slowly. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, let's check it out. Woo! All right, there you go. Vinegar and baking soda volcano maxed out. Thank that's you, Talita. Awesome. That was great. If you guys want any instructions for the stuff that we've done today, they're all on the website. And thank you very much for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. We kind of need to clean up a lot, don't we? Yeah. We have out here, we have the other room. So tell you what, uh, you get a mop, I will get the hose, and a wheelbarrow for the sud. Science Max is a show where we take small experiments and do them big. If you want to try these experiments yourself, go to our website for instructions. But not all the experiments on Science Max are the kind you should try at home. This one, yes. This, no. Try this, don't try this. A big yes, a big no. I, I don't know how you could possibly do this one at home. And remember, if you're ever not sure, ask an adult. Thanks for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. Chemicals! Chemicals! The chemistry of hydrophobic coating literally repels water molecules and doesn't let her. Chemicals! Chemicals! Hydrophobic coating.
The Hive. <laughs> Chemicals, yeah. yeah. Two carbon, two oxygen, four hydrogen. Whoa! Science! Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Facts, experiments at large. Today, Science Max is all about sound. We bend the power of sound to our will by making the loudest sound we can. A sub, wait a minute, a subwoofer. Subwoofer. Make cornstarch mud dance, glasses break, and things vibrate. It's the sounds of science. Today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science... Yeah, that's much better. Greetings, Science Maximites, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be talking about sound. Sound is all around us. We use it every day, but what is it, really? Sound is energy. Let's say that this is the... That this... No, stay. Stay. Okay that this spring is the sound of my voice. When I make noise, it travels away from me in a wave. One air molecule vibrates the next, the air molecule vibrates the next, and it looks like a wave. And when there's a little bit of energy, the wave doesn't move very much. Science! But when there's a lot of energy, the wave moves a lot. Science! What do we do? What do, what do we do? to make sound louder. This is the Science Max theme song. But it's not very loud because the speaker on my phone isn't designed to make super loud noises. So what we're going to do is find ways to make the volume of that song as loud as possible. Here is one way. Take a phone playing some music and put it in a glass. Make sure the glass is empty, of course. Huh? And suddenly, it's a lot louder. Wow! Why this works is one of the things we're gonna be looking at today. So that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're gonna learn how to make sound louder, as loud as we can. But I'm gonna need an expert to help me. Um, oh, I know, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. She's very smart. All I need to do is go to the Ontario Science Center and see if she's busy. Uh, yeah, Michaela, it's good to see you. Thanks to um, see you too. That was weird. I was wondering if you could give me a hand with an experiment. Oh, I'd love to, yeah. It's a sound experiment. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Right on. <laughs> okay, we'll take the portal. We'll go back to Science Max headquarters. Oh, take the portal? Cool. Haven't you taken the portal before? No, don't you remember? It wasn't working last time. Oh, well, it's. It's working? Fixed this time. Yeah, no, it'll be great. <laughs> Trust me. Here we go. Usually when I come through the portal, I land on something or something falls on me or... Not today. It's your lucky day. I guess so. Safe landing. Safe nice. landing. High five. All right. So let's get started. Okay, go. This is the experiment I want to max out today, Michaela. I know. Pretty impressive, right? No, no, hold on. <laughs> okay. So I take my phone and I play some music on my phone. And... 
It's loud, hey, right? Check it out. Hell, you've just made yourself a resonance chamber. A resonance chamber. A Very resonance nice. chamber is what we say when we're trying to describe how the sound is amplified. So if the sound's coming in from one direction, it's bouncing around, not really losing energy. Mm -hmm. So when more sound comes in, that's amplified. We hear it a lot louder. That's cool. So that's yeah. what I want to do. Hold on, let me turn this off. That's what I want to do today. I want to max out as much sound as we can get out of the Science Max theme song, oh, which I'm is so totally awesome. So what else can we do to do that? Uh, well, there's a couple avenues I'm thinking. Do you want to try something with electricity or without electricity? That's Because with electricity, we're talking speaker systems and... and yeah. Right. So why don't we do it. no electricity for now, and then All we right. can jump to electricity when we feel we've we've exhausted everything that's non-electric. Cool, so I was thinking we could try to make a megaphone because uh, if we have a lot of sound, we could you know, funnel it in one direction and then it'll be louder. Okay, what yeah, so the megaphone's pretty easy to make, right? We could just use, in fact, we could use this piece of paper, right? Yeah, let's try it. What do you think? Uh, I think it's very mega megaphony. Science taping it up. Okay, ready? <laughs> okay, turn it on, play it, and doesn't sound, but what if I do this? Hey, there it is. Right on. Oh, oh that song. yeah. <laughs> you hear it? Yeah. Oh, I hear it. Okay. <laughs> so that worked pretty well. So. Oh, yeah, it works. It works well. So, okay, so this is pretty easy, right? Yeah. Megaphone? Oh, yeah. So why don't we max this out? Why don't we make a giant megaphone and see if it makes a big difference? I think it will. Let's do it. Sounds good. Let's get started. <laughs> Is vibration, but it's really hard. To... It's really hard to learn about that vibration if you can't see it. I mean, sound is invisible, right? Well, here's a way that you can make sound visible. All you need is some plastic wrap and salt and a bowl, just a regular bowl, and an elastic like this. So what you do is you take the plastic wrap and cut off a piece just large enough to fit over the bowl, and then use the elastic to wrap around the bowl to keep the plastic tight. Pour some salt on the bowl, and then watch this. Hello, vibrating salt. The plastic wrap is stretched tight over the bowl, making it like a drum, a drum that's very sensitive to sound vibrations. Your ear works the same way. That's why we call it an ear drum. The vibrations from my voice make the plastic wrap vibrate, and that makes the salt dance. But there's more. Let's max this out. This is a cladney plate, and what it is is just a piece of metal on a platform that vibrates up and down to a frequency which I can program with this dial here. And when the sound waves vibrate the plate, they can interact in ways that make the sand form interesting patterns. Take a look. The sounds I'm generating vibrate the plate, make it move like a wave. But when the vibrations reach the edge of the plate, they bounce back and interact with the other waves going the other way. The way these waves interact at different notes is what causes the sand to make these different shapes. So this is great, but you know what? We can max it out even more. Maxing it out even more. That's about as much as I can take of that. Whoa. So Michaela and I are on a quest to make the loudest sound we can. The first step is to make things louder without using electricity. We've looked at a resonance chamber, and now we're going to make a large megaphone. Sounds can be amplified by bouncing sound waves around in a space. When I put my phone into the glass, the glass acts as a resonance chamber. The sound waves bounce around inside the glass and they combine and stack on top of each other. This makes the sound louder. Residence chambers are used by musical instruments like an acoustic guitar. The wooden chamber bounces the sound waves around and the sound waves build on each other to make the sound louder. A megaphone bounces sound waves as well. Instead of going off in all directions, a megaphone makes the sound waves all go in one direction. That's one of the reasons why a megaphone makes sounds louder, but only when it's pointed at you. 
So will a bigger megaphone work better? So we've made a larger megaphone, which is exactly the same thing. You just take a sheet and you roll it up, except our sheet was plexiglass covered in paper, and we've taped it together so it stays. And the idea here... Oh, yeah, bigger megaphone. We're going to vibrate even more of the air inside of here, and hopefully this thing will be louder. OK, so you're ready to try it with the phone? Yeah. I think first we should try it with our voices, though. OK. <laughs> Awesome, I can totally hear you, that's Either amazing. Way. And it would be fall. No, no summer, mm, spring, Think it's about it. anything but winter. So the maxed out megaphone worked, but we still had to try it with my phone. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah? Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. How about now? No, not so much, not so much. Oh yeah. No, no. So oh. that is a that great cool. example of non-electrical amplification. That's right. Amplify the sounds, no electricity. OK, bye-bye. <laughs>
The vibrations were so strong that the glass literally shook itself to pieces. <laughs> Science! Sorry. Science! Oh, wait. Science! Michaela and I have tried a resonance chamber and a giant megaphone to make sound louder. Now it's time to move on to the next step of the plan using electricity to help us amplify sound. And that means speakers. So speakers that you have at home, three different speakers here, right? Looks three really different busy. cones. Yeah, there's a lot going on. So what's the deal? Well, here at the bottom, uh, we have a subwoofer. A sub, wait a minute, a subwoofer. Subwoofer. So it's a, a woofer, the word is woofer. Yep. And it's, okay, so it's for dogs. <laughs> Right? No, no, a subwoofer is for low notes here in our speaker. Ah. At the top here, we have a tweeter. So it's for birds. It's it birds, dogs. <laughs> so low, well, let me guess, low notes? Yeah. It's tweeters, high notes? Yeah, yeah, high notes. And then we have this guy here in the middle, and that's called your mid-range speaker. Oh, that's not nearly a cool name. <laughs> now we have speakers, we've taken a look at that, but why don't we take one apart, cool. right? Yes, yeah, do it. I've got this one here that I spilled juice on. Um, so it doesn't work anymore. So I've kind of taken it apart. So cool. it's got. Oh, man, that's awesome. Okay, so it's got the cover. Yeah. That's cool. So what I find interesting is there's there's the speaker and the wires, right? Because uh, yeah. it's electrical amplification. But check this out. This is just a ring to hold that on, and the rest is just an empty box. We know what that is. Resonance, Resonance chamber. chamber. That's right. So that's why it's an empty box. So Let's take this apart too. See what's going on. Wow. So that's just that's the paper cone, yeah. right? So that's the like that's the drum, I guess. It's like the eardrum, the thing that vibrates. Yes. Yeah. yeah this cool thing vibrates. So that yeah. this whole that's thing. That's our electromagnet. When we turn this on, the electromagnet goes on and off, and uh, it's causing this whole thing to vibrate. So that's how it works. It's the electricity turning the electromagnet on and off. Exactly. And it's on and off, and on and off, and on and off, and on and off, <laughs> and then. It makes it makes it vibrate at certain speeds, right? Yeah. Hertz. The number yeah. of times it vibrates per second is hertz. What we could do is we could max it out with the speaker and plug the phone into the speaker. Mm -hmm. But this step does not feel like science max to me because oh. anybody can do that, right? Yeah. You can just turn up your television right now, and that's pretty much the same kind of thing. We yeah. need electrical amplification, but max it out. Max it out. What are you thinking? Okay, so I, I, I've got a friend. <laughs> yeah. And he's got a stereo system that he built, he put together. And what he does is he tours different cities. So he said he'd bring it by what? Science Max headquarters. He's gonna bring it here? We gotta go outside. We can see this thing. And it's very loud, so we have to go outside. Wait, when's he coming? Um, right now. <laughs> All right, let's go check it out. Seeing sound vibrations is fun. This kind of speaker is a special kind. It's called a subwoofer, which is designed to give you the low notes, the big rumbly bass sounds. I tilt the speaker so it's facing up and cover it with big sheets of plastic wrap, which I push into the cone. Then tape it so it's nice and secure. Then what you need is some cornstarch mud, which is two parts cornstarch, one part water. I've got some yellow cornstarch and some blue cornstarch. This experiment works the best with low notes. I'm playing a tone through the stereo that is very low. Here's what happens when I turn up the volume. which means when you impact it, it turns solid. So the vibrations from the speaker cone are making the cornstarch mud impact, and that's turning it into a solid. But then it sort of also melts back into a liquid, so you get little columns of cornstarch coming up and falling down again. It's like it's dancing. Whoa! Visual sound waves. Science! Science! So Michaela and I are going to max out sound. To do that, we need a maxed out sound system. This is going to be amazing. It's this so is going to cool. be super maxed out sound experiment. This I'm is so James, Michaela. Hey, James, how are you? Thanks for coming, buddy. Nice to meet you. So tell us about your 
speaker system. It looks a lot like a vehicle. <laughs> This is my audio van. It's got four 15-inch subwoofers in the back. It's got a whole bunch of power to power it, and I'm glad to be here to let you guys hear it today. Wow. Awesome. So if I have a speaker at home, the, like a little speaker like this, how many watts do you think that would be? Somewhere between 15 and 25. 15 and 25 watts, yes. And you've got 4,000. Yes. So that's a lot more. Yeah, quite a bit. And subwoofers, they play low notes. Yes. So is that better when you have a van like this? With a car audio van like this, you want to play low notes, like your house stereos, and that will play anything from 120 to 200 hertz. I'm playing 20 hertz to about 35 max for you guys today. So that's like a yeah. sort of rumble of thunder. Yes, very kind low. Of blah, 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 yeah. Where you really feel it. Yes. Like a train going past almost. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So we get our hearing protection on and we try it out. I know what you're thinking. Phil, what's the point of having loud music if you can't really hear it? Because we've gone from listening to music to feeling it. <laughs> the sound waves are so strong that they have become a physical presence. Michaela's hair flies around because the air from the speakers is creating shock waves. The sound waves are so powerful, they move the air back and forth, which makes Michaela's hair dance all over the place. And my hair, not so much. <laughs> I'm totally jealous of your long hair. Yeah, you need to get longer hair. Okay, hold on, I'll go right Okay. Here. Whoa! <laughs> Science back, experiments at large, super, super sound. sound! High fives. Yes. Okay, ready to go again? So cool, yeah, let's do it. Okay, here we go. show right now. I can't. Science. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! Today it's all about opposites. Things that float, and things that uh, don't. Water, and gravity. Gravity? What goes up doesn't have to come down. Unless it's built, you know, poorly. All on this episode of Science Max, experiments at large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil. And I am Opposite Phil. Opposite Phil. That's right. Blue lab coat, yellow shirt, evil mustache. I see. Anyway, we're looking at opposing forces today. That's uh, forces that make things go down. And forces that make things go up. Right. Things with more density and things with less density. Uh, gravity and the opposite, which is anti-gravity. Anti-gravity isn't really a thing. You're... Well, I have to do the opposite. Right. Um, buoyancy. And buoyancy's opposite, which is girlancy. No, girlancy is not the opposite of buoyancy. You know, you're not helping. Right. Not helping. Opposite. Ha-ha. <laughs> Hello. Uh, goodbye. Hey. Today, we're going to be making a gravity-powered boat. Ta-da! It's pretty easy to make. You just put water in the top here. Gravity of the water pushes it out the straw, and the boat goes forward. And it's super easy to make. You only need four things. A piece of styrofoam, a plastic cup, craft stick, and a straw. And the tools you'll need, a pen, a craft knife, and the help of an adult, 
and science glue. Which is the same as regular glue, except I only use this glue for science. You take your styrofoam and you cut it into a boat shape. That requires the knife and the help of the adult. Then take your cup and draw the circle that your cup will sit in. And then you want to put two slashes with your craft knife in there. Again, get the help of an adult if you need it. Uh, and then start carving out the styrofoam with your finger and make a nice little indent just like this for your cup to fit in. See, and then it fits in nice, nice and snug. So then what you want to do is you want to make a hole in the cup. You can use a pencil. The hole has to be just big enough for the straw to fit in. First, you want to take the straw and dig up in this direction so that it will be a nice angle for the water to come out. And then you want to get the straw back up into the cup like that and then glue it so that it is not going to leak any water. And then in the final step, and this is your choice, you don't have to do this, but you can use your craft stick and you can make a rudder. Or if you want, you can make a whole keel, which goes just like that and it is right in the middle of the boat, and this helps the boat go straight, because sometimes the straw goes off to the side one way or the other. Okay, water-powered boat. Actually, it's a water and gravity-powered boat. You see, what you do is you fill up the cup with water, and the gravity of the water in the cup pushes it out the straw, and the boat goes forward. And this is what it looks like in the water. You fill up the cup and the gravity pushes the water out that way. The buoyancy of the boat keeps it afloat and good old Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. The water going out the straw this way pushes the boat that way and it works pretty well. Whoa, if it's going straight. That's why we have the keel. Okay, so gravity powered boat, time to max it out. But first, I need an expert to help me. <laughs> oh, of course, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. Perfect. All right. And let's go. Along. So, we're gonna max it out and make it <laughs> super awesome. So, what do you wanna do to do that? Oh, man, well, what if we just think about making everything bigger? Okay. Right? Like, first, we're gonna need a bigger container. Okay, well, that's a good idea. Tell you what, I got my waterproof portal uh, ordering device. So, I'll order some sort of uh, a bin. Yeah. Like a big yeah. plastic bin. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Here it comes. Oh, there it is. Okay, so a big plastic bin. And then, you know, you see this straw here? What if we had something like that, except bigger, like? Like, um, like a pipe of some sort? Yeah, like a big pipe. One pipe coming up. I need to get myself one of those. Yeah, but it doesn't always work, so. Oh, here it is. Wow. So, bin is the cup. Yeah. Pipe is the straw. Yeah. Uh, so now all we need is the boat. Yeah, the platform itself. I think we need something that's going to be really stable, because we're going to have a lot of weight this time. How about like a surfboard or um or one of those stand-up paddle boards? Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah, okay, check this out. Uh-oh. Oh no. The water's stopping. That doesn't look good. I think it might have gotten stuck. Oh. We'll have to go get it. Because the water is still running and that oh, might overflow. Man, so. Buoyancy is the tendency for things to float. Things like this balloon or this ball in water. But it doesn't float on its own. But it doesn't float on its own. The helium is less dense than the air molecules around it. And they fall past the balloon and push it up. 
The ball is less dense than the water around it. So the water molecules flow around the ball and push it up. This happens because water is a fluid. The particles flow around each other. This works because air is a fluid. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, air isn't a fluid, but it is. Usually we think of fluid as meaning a liquid, but in this case, fluid means anything where the particles can flow around each other, and that includes air. But you know what? It's hard to see the particles in water. Same thing with air. I can say it, but it's really hard to see it. Now, um, yeah. Now this is sand, and it behaves like a fluid too. Well, sort of, check it out. Look, it's made of a whole bunch of very fine particles, and it takes the shape of its container. But watch this. I put a ball in the sand, and it doesn't float. Now the ball is less dense than the sand, but it doesn't float because the particles of sand have a little bit too much friction right now. But watch as we move them around and reduce the friction by adding some air. Now, this sand is behaving like a fluid, and the ball floats. Let's see what else floats on sand. How about this pumpkin? Yup, that floats. How about this block of wood? Yup, that floats too. How about this styrofoam ball? Yeah, that definitely floats. Look at that. The sand is a fluid right now because all of the little particles of sand are moving around. But watch this, if I turn off the air, everything freezes in place. Nothing floats anymore because the sand is no longer behaving like a fluid. So there you go, buoyancy. It all depends on the density of the thing and the fluid it's surrounded by. Huh? Science. Michaela and I are maxing out our gravity-powered boat. We had a bunch of maxed out materials. We just needed to get our surfboard. So we got our giant bin. We got a giant tube. Water's gonna come out of this end. And we've got a valve here, which means we can fill the bucket, and then we can turn on the valve and see what happens. Hey. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Now we're gonna turn on the valve, and that means now the water is flowing through. Ooh. Hey, it's working. It's not bad. Right on. Whoa, look at that. This thing is really working. Yeah, it's taking off now. So, okay, this is good. It's going about walking speed. Now that it's working, how do we max it out? Our fuel here is the water, so yeah. what if we just had even more water? And it doesn't last long, does it? Yeah. Maxing out our boat even more is easy. A bigger bin for more water and a wider pipe to move more water for more thrust. Okay, so a bigger bin yep. is a lot harder to fill because it's hard to get to the top of it. Well, you're working against gravity, so it's gonna work for us. I can really appreciate the amount of water that we're putting into this. That's that's four buckets full. Wow. This is five buckets. We open up the valve and it starts to go. Yeah. It's working. It is working. Look at wow. all the awesome <laughs> bubbles. Okay. It works really well. It really, yeah, it's wow. definitely faster than the other one. I think it's the larger pipe, and we need more water because it doesn't last very long. Check it out, it looks like it's going even faster now that we've lost a bit of the water. Less weight. Yeah. This is working great, so now how do we make it even better? Okay, well, the only force working with us right now is gravity, right? Of right. the water coming out. What if we add in an extra force? And we could squish the water down to go out faster. Okay, watery high five. <laughs> okay, we gotta get the, it's all the way over here. Come on, we gotta get it. move the water from this container to this container. Now, I could just pour it, but what if it's too heavy? It's too heavy! Help me, science! Well, science to the rescue with this! A clear plastic tube! Ooh, sciency. Okay, watch this. I'm gonna make a siphon, and it's pretty complicated, so follow along. Are you ready? I stick one end in here, and one end in here! Whoa! Yeah, I know, it's not working yet, but that's because we haven't added the science. First, we need to add a little bit of suction and suck the water through the hose like a straw. It has to go over the highest point. Watch this. And there we go. 
Look, the water is going up. I can even make the water go up even more, and it still works. But why does the water go up? Water doesn't like to go up, right? Well, the reason why is because there's more water going down than there is going up. So that creates suction on this end, and the gravity of this water pulls that water up. So gravity is doing all the work for us, and that is a siphon. Huh? So now let's max it out. This is the same container of water, but now it's colored slightly blue, so you can see it go all the way up through this hose. The only really hard part about this is sucking the water all the way up to there. OK, here we go. <laughs> I got it working. Now, the reason why it's working is because there's just a bit more water on this side of the tube than there is on this side of the tube. With a siphon, it doesn't matter how far you go up, as long as the water on one side is lower than the other. Science. You know about helium balloons, right? Helium is a harmless gas that is less dense than air, which is why helium floats. If I was to breathe some helium, my voice sounds higher because helium is less dense than normal air, so my vocal cords vibrate faster. Ah! Uh... But have you ever wondered, is there a gas that's more dense than air? There is. It's called sulfur hexafluoride, and it's much more dense than air, so if I was to breathe some, my vocal cords would vibrate slower, making my voice lower. Ha 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 ha! This container is full of sulfur hexafluoride. Ooh, I know, it's invisible, you can't see anything. But watch as I blow some bubbles. The bubbles are floating on top of that layer of sulfur hexafluoride. The bubbles float because they're full of regular air, which is less dense than the sulfur hexafluoride. In fact, a balloon will float on this as well. The balloon floats lower because the weight of the latex also drags it down a bit. But the bubbles and the balloons are floating on a sea of sulfur hexafluoride. And it is like a sea because it's a fluid just like water, but it's more dense than regular air. Science! <laughs> it's awesome! Michaela and I are maxing out our gravity-powered boat. It was already working well, but now our idea is to try squishing out the water so it gives the boat more thrust. We just had to come up with a brilliant idea how to do that. Garbage bag! Garbage bag! Yeah, garbage bag! Okay, maybe we should explain <laughs> oh, the garbage no. bag. Okay, so the garbage bag is attached to the pipe at the back end, and there's a hole in the, in the garbage bag. Well, we fill the garbage bag with water, <laughs> then we tie the garbage bag tight, tie the knot so the air doesn't get it. Now that we've got that, we use Bowling balls! And we put the bowling balls on top of the garbage bag, and this will, whoa, squish the water out. Really, it's pushing on that bag. Okay, ready? Okay, let's see. Hey, it's moving. It is moving. Our bowling balls were squishing the water out, but the boat didn't seem to be moving much faster. I think the bowling balls made the whole thing too heavy. What if we raise the bin up? If it's higher up, then there would be more force due to gravity. Yeah, so we have the bin on like stilts or something, oh and then it has to fall further, and then maybe the water's going faster. I love that idea. Okay, good. Yeah, let's try it. So what we need to do is get Wait, this. No. Oh, I thought this was a shallow no, pool. Yeah, no, that's no, that over was, there. That's that yeah, one. yeah, not here. Max Historica. Long, long ago, in the time of ancient Greece, there lived a genius named Archimedes. One day he was in the tub and he noticed something. Oh, hello. Look at that. When I get into the tub, the water level goes up, and when I get out of the tub, the water level goes down. Ha <laughs> ha! Eureka! I, um, don't get it. Well, I can calculate how much volume something takes up by how much water it displaces. Yep, still not with you. Uh... Now, I'll give you an example. How much water would be displaced pushed aside if I put this ball in the water. It's light, so not much. Ah, it doesn't matter how heavy it is. It only matters how much space it takes up. Watch. Ah, you see? The same volume, huh? I think I see. 
How much water will be displaced when I put this bowling ball in? Uh, more because it's heavier. Ah, nope. It doesn't matter how heavy it is. It only matters how much space it takes up. Watch. Oh. You see? A simple and easy way to measure something's volume. Archimedes, one of the greatest and cleanest scientists in history. Join us next time for more Max Historica. The metric system in 60 seconds. The metric system is a way of measuring things. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, a kilometer is 1,000 meters, but few people realize just how interconnected the metric system is. First of all, it breaks down to a base 10 system. Everything is 10, 100, or 1,000 of everything else, and it's all based on water. This is exactly one liter of water. It weighs exactly one kilogram. It fits into a cube 10 centimeters on each side. It boils at 100 degrees Celsius and freezes at zero. And this happy little fellow is one milliliter. It fits into a cube one centimeter on every side. It weighs exactly one gram. And the amount of energy required to raise this one degree Celsius is one calorie. The metric system, everything interconnected and all based on water. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh. Uh oh. Michaela and I are experimenting on our maxed out gravity powered boat. Trying to squish the water out with bowling balls added too much weight for it to make much of a difference. So now we've raised our tote higher up, which means the water will have farther to fall and be going faster when it comes out. And I got a totally awesome name for our boat. Tell me, what's up? Totes McBoats. That's a totally awesome name! Totes McBoats! Yes! Okay, so are we ready to fire up Totes McBoats? That's right, yeah. Okay, ready. I'm going to turn on the valve. Okay, ready? And let go! Totes McBoats! What we hadn't considered is that much weight that high up would be uh, tippy. Uh, Totes McBoats no longer afloat. We needed a way to solve the tipping problem first. You know what we need to do? What? We need to build an outrigger. All right, so check it out. This time we have an outrigger, which means our boat's gonna be a whole lot more stable. It's not gonna fall that way because this thing is floating. And it's not gonna fall this way because it has a lot of mass as well. I think we're almost ready, eh, Phil? Yeah. Okay, are you ready? Ready. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. Turn on the valve. Here we go. Go, oh. toast me, boats. Oh, yeah. Hey. Yes. Our gravity-powered water boat worked great. The water ran down from high up, giving it more speed due to gravity, but no more mass than before. And our outrigger kept the whole thing from tipping over. Totes McBoats was a success. Thank you very much, Science Max Experiments at Large. Gravity-powered boat, otherwise known as... Totes McBoats! Totes, come back, Totes! Come back! Come in. Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> no, but you can totally come in. Oh, oh, oh. The extra speed. It's the speed of the water, right? Oh, hold it steady. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. This episode of Science Max is all about vibration and frequency. Frequency and vibration. What's the difference? We build a maxed out vibrobot, spin a giant disc, suspend water, and play with lasers. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites, and welcome to Science Max. 
Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're gonna be looking at vibration. Vibration is when things go back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> All kinds of things vibrate, like pendulums. Pendulum. Wait, wait, and pendulum. Pendulums are designed to swing back and forth. Stop that. Also, metronomes. Me oh. <laughs> metronomes are used by people when they're when they're practicing music to keep accurate time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Putting it back. And okay. We're gonna be building. Whoa, okay. We're gonna be building. <laughs> this little guy. This is a vibrobot. And he vibrates and he skitters around on the paper. And if we take the caps off the markers, he makes interesting patterns on the paper. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Let's build a vibrobot. Like, oh, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's time to take off the ski boots, huh? Oh. There we go, that's better. So today, like I said, we're gonna be making a vibrobot. And here are all the materials you need to make your own. Plastic cup, three markers, an electric motor, just make sure you ask an adult first, a battery, a plastic drink bottle cap, a toothpick, scissors, this kind of tape is called electrical tape. Science tape, which is the same as invisible tape, but of course I use this tape only for science. And some modeling clay. And these are two bendy straws that I've taped googly eyes to. These are not necessary. I just like them for decoration. Now remember, if I'm going too fast here, which I probably will be, you can get all of the steps on how to make your very own Vibrobot on our website. Okay, so here's how you get started. First, you're gonna make the feet for your Vibrobot. So I attach some science tape to the markers, and then I put the marker on the bottom of the cup. And then I do that again to the next marker, and then the third, balance it like that. There. Next thing you wanna do is take your plastic drink bottle cap and make a hole with a toothpick. You wanna make it off to the side, right about there, just like that. That's so when it turns, it will be off center. That's what's gonna give us our vibration. So once you've made that hole, Take some modeling clay and stick it in the cap to give it some weight. When you've done that, stick it onto the shaft of your motor like this. See how it's off center there? Now we just need to attach it to the Vibrobot. I just put it right here on the top and I like to attach the battery to the back of the cup. And now finally, we're going to attach the eyes. We take some science tape and we put the straws over here. I am Vibrobot. I am here to vibrate. Take me to your leader. So then you attach your tape with the wire to the top of the battery there, and then the other wire to the bottom of the battery, just like that, and let your Vibrobot make some art. <laughs> now, if the battery is new, your Vibrobot might be jumping up and down quite a bit. So you can do what I like to do and add some more weight, and then you make better lines with your Vibrobot. And your Vibrobot makes art. How long will he last? Probably till lunch. And there you go, Vibrobot art. Art made by a robot. How cool is that? So that's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna meet Chris from Logics Academy and he's gonna help me max out the Vibrobot. Plus, we're gonna learn a little bit more about vibration. Come on. Oh, hey, Chris. Oh, uh, oh, hey, Phil. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Okay, here's your Science Max lab coat. Thank you. So you guys at Logics Academy, you also build a Vibrobot, right? That's right, we do. This is mine, and it works pretty well. That's awesome. So, I wanna max this out. Cool. So I thought we would start with, instead of this motor, we would start with this motor. Wow. It used to be a round circle, but I cut it off so that it's off-center. Perfect. We've also got this is our battery. Fantastic. That's as far as I've gotten so far. Well, it looks like we need a frame next. Right, something to be the cup. That's right. So we just need some sort of larger cup. 
Ooh, how about that metal shelf over there? Oh, this thing? Yeah. This is just something I keep my parts on. It's perfect. Really? Yep, the shelves will house everything that we need, and it looks like it'll be strong enough to hold everything together. Now, the Vibrobot had markers on the bottom of it. That's right. To make a little pattern. Should we try that with this? Because we're going bigger, what if we use paint and paintbrushes instead? Okay, sure. We could attach paintbrushes to the legs. Pass me one. All right, so now all we need to do is get some paint and some paper. That's right. And, uh, and we can fire it up. Okay, let's, let's move it over this way. Vibration and frequency. What's the difference? They're all connected. Ta-da! Now, whoa. Wow. Vibration is things going back and forth. Back and forth. And back and forth. It's a cycle. Cycle, 25 bucks. Oh, yeah, it's the wrong kind of cycle. Never mind. Well, if that's vibration, then what's frequency? Well, frequency is a measure of how fast or slow, how frequent those vibrations happen. Look at this bowling ball. It is swinging back and forth, but not very fast. You could say it has a low frequency. We measure all kinds of things by the frequency. This thing is terrifying. When you turn the dial on your radio, you're tuning in to different frequencies of radio waves. Hey, look at this punching balloon. It's going very fast. You could say it has a high frequency. <laughs> so, now you know. Vibration is something going back and forth, and frequency is how quickly it does it. Yeah. Ramona, the bowling ball keeps coming through everything. How do you turn it off? Okay, back to our main experiment. Chris and I are taking a Vibrobot and maxing it out. We have a large motor and a battery, and we're taping it all to some shelving. Just like our small Vibrobot, our motor needs something to make it unbalanced when it spins. That's what will cause the vibrations. It's just taped. I haven't attached it in any other way. Do you think that's okay? As an engineer, I have superior faith in duct tape. Okay, well, that, that's good to know. We're also adding an on-off switch and some paintbrushes on the bottoms of the legs so our maxed out Vibrobot can make art just like the small one. The final step, dipping the brushes in paint and setting it on a big piece of paper. We fire it up and it immediately shakes everything off the shelves. Oh! oh it, it totally spilled all the stuff on the shelves. The motor shakes the Vibrobot a lot, but there's a problem. All that shaking is starting to take its toll on the shelves. The wheels come off, the screws come out, and finally... It totally it shook itself apart. Destroyed itself. The shelving unit just completely falls apart when it's being shaken. Vibration is really hard on the structure of an object. We need something more sturdy, something that can, that can take weight. Steps, maybe? Yeah. OK, hold on. OK. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this looks much better. Okay, great. So we build the new Vibrobot out of this. So more paint brushes, bigger motor, more paint, more everything. More everything. All right, good. This is a pendulum. It's just a weight suspended on a line and anchored from above. Pretty simple. Pendulums were used for hundreds of years for all kinds of reasons, but most famously in clocks. Why were pendulums used in clocks? Well, here's why. Let's mark every time the pendulum hits the bottom of the swing right here. Okay, watch. All right, now here's the question. How fast will the beeps be if I swing it from much higher up? Let's find out. No matter how high the pendulum swings, it keeps the same frequency. That's why they were used in clocks, because it could swing for a long while, and even though it would lose energy, it would still keep perfect time. The frequency of a pendulum doesn't change, no matter how high it swings or how much weight is on the bottom. The frequency comes from how long the line is. Now this is a pendulum wave. Because each bowling ball has a line that's a different length, they have a slightly different frequency. 
They start out swinging together, but soon they start to make interesting patterns. Remember, each pendulum is keeping its own perfect time, even if it's slowing down. It's only the length of the line that gives each pendulum a different frequency. And now, we're gonna max it out with, with, um, well, I guess these are already bowling balls, so this is already pretty maxed out. I'm just gonna, just gonna leave that there. These are balloons. This is a laser, and these are awesome laser safety glasses. Now, lasers are made of light, and light has a frequency. In fact, each color of light has a different frequency. This is a red laser. Check it out. Yeah, cool. This is also a very powerful laser. Oh, I can pop the blue balloon with the red laser because the blue absorbed the red light from the laser and then it heated up and the balloon popped. But here's the cool thing. I cannot pop a red balloon with a red laser because the red balloon reflects the red light from the red laser and I can't pop it. If I wanted to pop a balloon with a red laser, I need to use a darker balloon, one that absorbs the red light, like <laughs> like a black balloon. <laughs> so there you go. Lasers, frequencies of light. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this red balloon because it's always nice to have a balloon. <laughs> Chris and I are maxing out the Vibrobot, but our last version shook itself apart. Now the plan is to start with something more solid and try again. We found some very solid steps and added an even bigger motor, an even bigger battery, and attached a half circle wheel to make the vibrations when the motor spins. We add some paintbrushes and fire it up. Here we go. Come on. Go, by robot. Hmm. Watch the move. Is it moving at all? Hmm. Hmm. So it's still not working. It's sort of getting caught in the paper and it's on the paintbrushes. And the, yeah, the paintbrushes seem to be absorbing too much vibration and then the paper's stopping it as well. So why don't we remove the paintbrushes? Yeah. And we might as well remove the paper if we don't have any more paintbrushes. Yes. And we'll see what happens. Let's see what happens. Okay. No paintbrushes, no paper. Okay. Now let's try it. Three, two, one, go! Yeah! Aha! It's moving. Not bad. The shaking is good, but I don't know if the shaking is enough. So what do we do? Well, we could add another battery. Another battery which would give it more power? That's right. OK, let's try that. OK. OK, so it wasn't working before. No. Not enough power. And now we've got a second battery here. That's right. We've wired them up so that one power feeds into the other, so we've got twice as much juice as we do. So it's just a matter of clipping this onto there. That's right. But hold on. Yeah, safety glasses, because now we don't know what's going to happen anymore. Ready? Three, two, one. The extra battery makes a big difference. The new Vibrobot shakes around and only shakes itself apart a little. All right, Whoa. that was amazing. <laughs> okay, so all we needed was more power. That's right, I think it didn't have enough power to, to vibrate up and down and that's why it wasn't moving every time it hit the ground. So I think if we're gonna use this much power, I think we need to build it again. Okay. Build it even stronger and with a bigger motor. Yeah. And more power. And then maybe I ride it. <laughs> But you think we can build that? Of course. Of course. Okay, let's do it. You want to see something cool? I can make this water levitate. Defy gravity using the power of science. You want to see? Behold! <laughs> gravity defying water. I can even make the water go very slowly. Or I can make the water go back up into the hose. Or I can make the water completely stop. <laughs> you know what's interesting? The water does not seem to be stopped for me. You see stopped water because you are looking at it through a TV camera. See? Real life, TV camera. Real life, 
TV camera. You see, movie cameras and TV cameras take a whole bunch of still photos and then run them together really, really fast. 24 times a second for our TV cameras. I have created a device that drops water at 24 times a second. And what happens is everything lines up. So it looks like the water drops aren't moving. But watch this. I grab the hose and it's fine. But I let it go and the hose is vibrating back and forth at exactly the same time the camera shutter is going back and forth and everything looks like it stopped. The power of frequency has defied gravity. Okay, so not really. It's kind of a camera trick, but I prefer to call it science. Here's a fun way to play with things going back and forth. This is Euler's disc, and it's designed to spin like this. What's going on is friction and gravity are slowing that down and pulling it towards the Earth. Now, you don't need a fancy disc like this to do this at home. All you need is a pot lid. Check it out. When the pot lid spins, friction and gravity start to slow it down, which means each spin gets lower and lower and the frequency gets higher and higher. But the difference between a pot lid and Euler's disc is Euler's disc is made to go for as long as possible. The heavy puck has a slightly rounded edge and sits on a glass surface that is slightly concave, like a bowl. All of this is designed to make Euler's disc last a really long time, which is, which is quite a while. But eventually, friction and gravity pull the disc down, and finally, it stops. Pretty amazing, right? Well, wait till we max it out. This is Trevor, head of the Science Max build team. Hey. Thanks for setting this up, Trevor. So what is this? This is a giant side of a spool, big hydro spool. OK, so this is the largest disk that we could totally find. And we've got it all hooked up here. We lift it up, we spin it, and then you pull the thing, and it will drop down and, and spin like a coin, because it's the only way we can do that with something this heavy. Yeah. Ready? I'm ready. OK. Trevor and I hoist it up and get it suspended above the ground. Yeah. Then I start to wind it up. Ready? When it's going fast enough. And go, Trevor! Trevor pulls the release and... It turns out a 200 kilogram spinning disc works exactly the same. As it spins and rolls, gravity and friction work on it, and the frequency speeds up as it gets closer to the ground until it stops. Giant Oilers disc. Nicely done, Trevor. That was awesome. That was great. Let's do it again. All right. Our Vibrobot was working well, so that means it's time to make it way bigger. We started with a big metal table and added a huge motor, one 20 times as powerful as the last one. Instead of batteries giving us 12 volts of power, we're going to use a plug, which is 10 times more power. We've added an off-center wheel for vibration, bolted the motor to the frame, and added a protective cage all around to prevent anything from flying off. It even has a seat for me to ride. OK. OK. You ready? Ready. Here we go. We fire it up, and it's very shaky. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That was really uncomfortable. <laughs> oh. It was like very bangy, even with the, even with the seat. Yeah. Uh, I'm going I'm to try standing on it. All right. It. When I try standing on it, the Vibrobot lives up to its name. It vibrates all around the lab. Oh, wow. My legs are numb to, to the knee. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Bye, robot! All right. Yeah, that worked really well. That was awesome. I can't, I really can't feel my feet right now. And it held together, which is impressive. That's right, the more power and the stronger structure paid off. Yeah, I, the only thing I regret is not getting a chance to, wait a minute, wait a minute, come with me. 
Okay, so I achieved my dream of riding the Vibrobot. You did. But we never got a chance to make art. So we've dipped a whole bunch of nuts and bolts and heavy things in paint. Yeah. And now we're gonna turn on the Vibrobot and see if we can make some art. <laughs> Let's see how it looks. Oh, wow. Ta-da! Vibrobot art. Vibrobot has been a huge success and we got some art to keep. High fives. Well done. Science Max, experiments at large. Who gets to keep the art? Uh, rock, paper, scissors. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, tie. One, two, three. Tie. One, two, three. One, two, three. Wow. One, two, three. Ah, oh, tie. One, two, three. Man. There's gonna be a red balloon, but those red balloons are gonna be pushing this way. And then this afternoon, we're gonna have this blue balloon, which is quite nice. Over to you, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Science! I figured we would have maybe a bigger motor. Yes. Or a bigger, no. I'm gonna try that again. <laughs> All thrusters ahead. Whoa! <laughs> Balloons. <laughs> science! Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> yeah. My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. Science Max! It's time to get stuck on magnets. What's our attraction to magnets? What's their attraction to each other? And can I use magnets to levitate and float in the air? All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today we're going to be looking at the power of mag magnets. You see, magnets are fun things to experiment with because they are really, okay, they're really interesting. Um, this magnet that I've got here is a neodymium magnet or a rare earth magnet. It's one of the, oh, one of the, one of the strongest magnets you can get. Um, a magnet is an object that is attracted to, uh, Anything that is ferromagnetic, which is iron, nickel, or cobalt. And mag magnets are interesting because they have two sides. There are two, uh, oh, there are two poles. I'd show you, but I can't get the chain off. Hold on one second. Ha ha. Mm. There are two. Oh, no. There are two poles to every magnet, uh, just like the Earth. There is a North Pole and a South Pole. That's right, the Earth is a giant magnet. So, if you take kitchen magnets, you'll find that there's two different poles. I've written North and South on these ones. They don't normally come like that. If you put the North and the South together, they stick. But if you put the North and North or South and South together, they repel. They repel, see? They don't want to go together at all. And you can force them together if you want, but if you do, they will spring away the second you let them go. <laughs> but when magnets repel each other, I find that some of the most interesting stuff. Check this out. This is just a small container, and I've got a magnet in here, and I have a loony attached to it so that it fits nicely in the container like that. For the top, I've attached two magnets together, and I have another coin on it. And if you put them in there, I've made sure that the two poles repel each other, which means this magnet will just sit there and float. Magnetic levitation. Very interesting, and you can pop the top on that if you want and just carry around a levitating magnet. 
Now, there's a couple fancier ways you can levitate stuff with magnets. This is just a wooden frame I've made. Uh, this is completely not necessary. You can use just about anything in your house. A desk lamp works really well. The important part is I've tied a magnet to the end of this arm here, and this is a bolt, which is attracted to the magnet, but it's got a thread tied to it, so it can't get there just far enough that it will actually hang in mid-air. Look at that, it's not attached to anything, it's just being pulled up by the attraction from the magnet. The thing is, as soon as you pull the bolt away far enough, it will lose the attraction and it'll just fall. Very cool. Here's one that's a little bit more complicated, but is also really neat. This one uses disc magnets, which have a circle or a hole in the middle of them here. And you put two around a pencil and then four more in such a position that you can put the pencil against this wood on the side and it will just levitate on its own. You can even give it a spin. Look at that. And if you want to make a levitating pencil yourself, there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to build an easy-peasy version on our website. Meantime, we are going to max this out. Magnetic levitation on Science Max experiments at large. But you're probably thinking, what are we going to levitate? Well, we're going to levitate me. At least, that's the plan. That's why I'm going to the Center for Skills Development and Training. Come on. small and, and only only going down to waist level this is the weirdest room i've ever been in where where am i what's going on I... hey matt hi phil this is matt he's from job master magnets now you guys use lots of big magnets right that's right we do awesome so maybe you could help me max out this wow you did a great job of building the levitating pencil experiment. Yeah, so what's going on here exactly? Well, all magnets have at least a north and a south pole. Right. And when you put like poles together, they want to repel. Oh, okay. So have you ever levitated a person? Not yet. Well, let's do it. All right. Do you think we can use these? We can try. Okay, well, uh, put that one on the ground. And okay, so north, and I'll put the north one on my foot here. And then if I just step, oh, wait a minute. If I step, stop moving. If I step on that. Step on the... Okay, well, first of all, the, this magnet keeps sort of moving right. away from me when I try to push down on it. Uh, what do we do? How do we fix this? Well, we need to keep the magnets in position so that they don't move around when you try to put them together. Yeah, because I have to come straight down on it, don't That's I? That's right. So why don't we attach this one to the floor? Good idea. And then we'll put a board on this one, and we'll see how it goes. Perfect. Okay, let's do it. All right. This is a magnet. This is a magnet. This is a magnet. This is a shoe. What's the difference? To know that, you have to know your magnets. This is a donut. It does not stick to this magnet. This is a spoon. It sticks to this magnet. These paper clips stick to this magnet. This shoe does not. So what has attracted the magnets? Only things that are ferromagnetic. Here's the difference. Horseshoe, horseshoe magnet. This one is a magnet. This one is not. But the horseshoe sticks to the horseshoe magnet, because this one's a magnet and this one is ferromagnetic. Only things that are ferromagnetic are attracted to magnets. Things that are not attracted to magnets, they're not ferromagnetic. Plastic, banana, mitten, sandwich, magazine. No, but how do you know? Do you go around the world sticking a magnet to every single thing one at a time? Hey, Ma, I need you to come over. I need to see if you're ferromagnetic. No, ferromagnetic. 
No, you don't need to do that. First of all, only metals are ferromagnetic. So that eliminates all your clothing, your luncheon meats, your magazines, what have you. Everything that's non-metal, you don't need to worry about. Never mind, Ma, it doesn't matter. But this clock is metal. It doesn't stick. Well, not all metals are ferromagnetic. Mainly just the ones with iron, nickel, or cobalt. And there you have it. Now you know your magnets. I hit the phone on the magnet there. Okay, uh, can you hear me, Ma? Hang up the phone. Hang up. Hang up the phone, Ma. My first attempt at levitating had the magnets sliding all over. So the plan is to take the bottom magnet and attach it to a big wooden board so it won't go anywhere. Then attach another plank to the top magnet to make it a little easier to stand on. Okay, that uh, is definitely attached to the floor. Thank you. All right, now, if I just get this lined up, whoa, look at that. It can totally, oh, wait a minute, totally, it doesn't want to stay put. Oh, wait a minute. They levitate. Come on. Levitate. Why doesn't it want to stay? It just doesn't. Hmm. Should I stand on it? Okay, I'll stand on it. Here we go. And. Ah! Ha! Ah. Am I levitating? No. No. Hmm. So why isn't this working? Well, just like your pencil experiment. We need a shaft through the center to hold the magnets in position. Oh, yeah, maybe we could use, like, a ring magnet. Yes. That, like we used with the pencil. Right. And? And we're gonna need stronger magnets. We're gonna need stronger magnets. Are the ring magnets strong? Yes, they can be. Awesome. All right, let's do it. All right. Now it's time for a Science Max quiz. Which one of these things do we have magnetism to thank for? Birds flying south in the winter, music, or a sandwich? If you picked A, you're right. Some birds migrate in the spring and fall using the Earth's magnetic field. Many animals can sense the Earth's magnetic field and use it to navigate. Migrating birds fly hundreds or thousands of kilometers north or south when they migrate in the spring and fall. A compass works the same way, by using magnetism to point to the Earth's magnetic North Pole. But if you picked B, music, you're right! Here's some music. The way you're hearing this music is because the musicians recorded their instruments using microphones, which use magnets. And then the signal was translated by a computer and stored on its hard drive, which uses magnets. Then it was broadcast to your TV and comes out your speakers, which use, you guessed it, magnets. And for those of you who said you have magnetism to thank for your sandwich, haha, <laughs> well, you're right. You see, you'd probably go to the kitchen to make that sandwich, right? Well, I'm guessing you got all of the tasty ingredients from your refrigerator? Well, it works on electricity, which is produced by magnets. And then there's an electric motor in the fridge that circulates the air and keeps it cool. And guess what? Magnets. And finally, the door on your fridge stays closed because the door has magnets. So there you go. You can thank magnetism for birds flying south, music, and your sandwich. It just goes to show, when you're talking about magnets, everybody wins because magnets are everywhere. This has been a Science Max Quiz. Mini Max! Here's an experiment you can do with a bag of water. Take a sharpened pencil and carefully push it through the bag. If you do it carefully, it won't spill. The reason this works is because the bag is made of polymers, long stretchy chains of molecules, and also because the pressure of the water against the pencil prevents any water from spilling out. Now, we're gonna max it out. This is a very large bag of water, and here I have some very large pencils. You ready? Oh. Uh. 
<laughs> That's one. That's two. Here we go. Should I go from the bottom? Ta-da! Science! Okay, okay, okay. I know what you want. Like I was saying, science! Turns out, trying to balance two repelling magnets on top of each other is pretty much impossible. Here's why. This is a magnet, and here is the magnetic field. It's often drawn with lines like this, but actually the magnetic field radiates out in all directions. Really, think of the magnetic field kind of like a ball. When you try to balance another magnet on top of the first magnet, it's about as hard as balancing one ball on top of another ball. So here's the plan. Just like the levitating pencil, we're going to use ring magnets because we can put a shaft through the center of one ring, then drop another ring magnet on the shaft. It will keep them perfectly aligned. Then it's just a matter of putting the bottom magnet on a board to keep it stable and using another board so I can stand on it and ta-da, magnetic levitation. Or at least that's the plan. Okay, board. Magnets. Magnets. Ooh, look at that. Awesome. And now I'm gonna put the platform on. Nice. And I got some weights here. Let's see how this works. Yeah. This is gonna work amazing. All right, think I should try it? Give it a try. Okay. Here we go. Huh? Huh? Yeah! I'm doing it! I'm levitating! What? Just a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah. So, hmm. Yeah, what do we do? We need more power. More power? I like that idea. How do we give it more power? Uh, more shafts, more magnets. Okay, sure. Well, why don't we do um, why don't we do one, two, three, four shafts, and then we'll have magnets on all the shafts. Great idea. All right, let's do it. If you attach something ferromagnetic like this washer to a magnet, not only does it stick, but the magnetic field travels down the metal, making it a magnet too which means you can stick more and more things to each other, and they will continue to stick until you run out of magnetic field. You can do this yourself at home with anything ferromagnetic. Paper clips work pretty well, or washers like I have, or screws, or bolts, and they'll continue to stick to each other as long as the magnetic field is strong enough. You can see it's getting pretty weak here. And they'll all stay magnetized as long as the first one is still attached to the magnet. But if you want to go even further, all you need to do is keep adding more magnets to reinforce the magnetic field. I've got a few here, like this. Let's get the chain started, like that. And then I've got a magnet attached to this washer so it will keep the magnetic field strong. And I continue to add um, one magnet, one washer, and we'll just see how far I can go. You can even sculpt it a little bit. Look at that. And then at the end, a whole bunch of paper clips. Eventually, the weight will make it fall off, but it's a lot of fun to play with magnets and make art. Speaking of art you can make with magnets, you can also make sculptures. When everything sticks to everything else, you can make some pretty fancy designs. This is a rare earth magnet, a very strong one, and a bunch of nuts that I've gotten. And this one here is an electromagnet, but electromagnets are a little different because they need an electric current to work. Check this out. This is sort of a magnet dude with crazy hair. There's an earth magnet here, and this is a giant screw, and these are some metal bits, and then I've got two more magnets at the top here to hold on his crazy wire hair. He's got crazy wire hair because he's crazy magnet, dude. Now, of course, we couldn't just talk about magnetic sculptures without maxing it out, so let's max it out. 
This is a bunch of scrap metal from leftover experiments, and I've got a bunch of rare earth magnets, and now I'm gonna max out a magnet sculpture. Let's see. There you go, a maxed out magnet, me. I made this guy out of metal pipes with earth magnets in between, and these are his arms attached, of course, with magnets. His hand, his little metal pieces attached with magnet. Steel wool for the hair, and of course, hat, non-magnetic. All right, here we go, ready? Uh, uh. Wanna see a magic trick? Simple copper tube. Drop things through it. Nothing unusual happens, but watch when I drop a magnet through. What? It's not magic, it's science. Because the magnet creates a magnetic field, when it goes through the tube, the magnetic field repels the magnet upwards. Now the field isn't perfect, so the magnet doesn't come to a stop, but still it slows down from a fall to a nice graceful drop. Take a look from above. Pretty amazing, right? Magnets, not magic, science. So I've managed to levitate on some magnets, but just barely. What Matt and I needed was more power. So instead of having one shaft and one pair of ring magnets, we're going to use a larger board and put a shaft on each corner. Then we'll have four times the power because we're using four times the magnets. Hopefully this will be strong enough to get me floating on a cushion of magnetic energy. And magnets? Magnets. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is gonna work great. And top board. Mm-hmm. Ooh, what do you think? Looks great. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Matt? You're levitating. I'm levitating! Woohoo! All right. It feels cool. It's sort of like, it sort of feels like surfing a little bit. All right, thank you so much, Matt. That was amazing. And there you have it. Science Max, experiments at large, magnetic levitation. You know, I'm surprised we could do an entire episode on magnets, and we never actually got them so close to the camera that the camera went all weird, because cameras are magnets, they don't, oh, oh dear. Uh-oh. Um, no, that's okay. I can, I can, well, I can fix this. If I just, maybe, no. If, maybe if I put the magnet to the camera again, that would, oh, oh, okay, that's not. Uh, no. That didn't help. Oh, okay, well, thanks very much for watching uh, Science Max. Experiments at large, and uh, we'll see you again uh, as soon as we, we get a new camera. Today, we're going to be looking at the power of magnets. Magnets. Mm, magnets. Wait, okay. This one here is called a neodymium magnet, or a rare earth magnet. It sticks to this magnet. Magnet. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Today, we're looking at polymers. Polymers, polymers, polymers. Word has lost all meaning. Plastics, latex, rubber, and our favorite polymer, slime. Oh, yeah. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Hello, oh, greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and I think I might have overdone it with the science. I mean, what's a better use of science than creating a whole bunch of slime? Well, I did, and you know what? It's really cool. <laughs> slime. I love slime. It always makes me feel like a mad scientist, but I need a good mad scientist laugh. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it needs work. Anyway, today we're talking about polymers. Polymers like slime. But you see, polymers aren't really a substance. They're more how something is constructed. And there's all kinds of different polymers. There's slime, obviously, and rubber polymers like, well, like rubber. And there's also hard polymers like plastic. Now, polymers are all kind of constructed the same way. Like this. This is a chain. Yeah, so imagine this is a chain of molecules and all the molecules are the same and they just repeat in a long line. Now, when you get a polymer like slime, all the chains are not connected or very loosely connected, which means that they can flow over each other like a slime or sort of like a liquid and they behave like that. So that is slime. But when you get to a rubber polymer, you start to get little bonds in between the chains of polymers that work like this. You see, they still move around a little bit, but they can, they can spread apart and they become flexible and bouncy. Yeah, I know, a chain, a chain doesn't really bounce, but rubber polymers do. Huh? Now, when it gets to a solid polymer like plastic, there's a lot more links and it's all kind of interconnected and it doesn't move at all. It doesn't move, okay, again, harder to tell with a chain, but plastic is very hard and rigid. So let's dive into the world of polymers and make some slime. <laughs> yeah, too mad, not enough scientist. I'll keep working on it. Anyway, to make slime, take your white glue and pour in uh, an amount. It really kind of depends on how much slime you want to make. Now, you want to add about twice as much water as that. Uh, yeah, somewhere around there, great. Now we want to put in just a little bit of soap. Mm -hmm, maybe there, that's good. And you want to put in your food coloring. I like green. Green seems like the right slime color to me. It's the right appropriate mad scientist kind of slime. And then you want to start mixing that up till you get the right kind of consistency. That means make sure the glue and the water are equally mixed up. Good. And now we're ready to make it an actual slime by bonding the polymers together by adding liquid starch. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you want to mix it up. When you add the liquid starch, it starts to bond the chains of molecules together, changing it from a liquid to a slime. It's coming along. And there you go. Slime. Now, if you want clear slime and not opaque slime, you want to use clear glue and not white glue. But that's basically the recipe. So there you go. Slime. <laughs> Too super villain? Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, we go. All right. Now all you need is an expert to help me max it out. Of course, my interface is hand gesture based, so I don't know if the slime. Oh, hey, there we go. Great. So, you get it. Uh huh. Uh, oh, of course. Sarah from Mad Science. Mad Science, they really know their slime. This is great. Okay, I got it. Close, 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 close. Yeah, hey, there we go. All right. Ugh. I'm not sure if bringing it through the portal is such a good idea, but at least I'll have it on the other side. Ugh. I have a pot. Why do I have a pot? I didn't have a pot when I went through the portal. Is someone somewhere missing a pot or did it just create this pot out of nothing? Huh. <laughs> hey, hey, Sarah. Hey, hi, how are you doing? Good, Sarah from Mad Science, you're gonna help me make some slime. Yes, I actually brought some. Oh, this isn't, this isn't slime, this is a pot lid. Hey. Oh. Well, uh, at least we have a set. Doesn't answer any questions though. And I guess we're gonna have to make some more slime. Definitely, what kind of slime do you wanna make? Uh, what do you mean, what kind? Is there more than one kind? Oh yeah, there are tons of different kinds of slime with lots of different ingredients and recipes. Oh, I only know the one. Can you show me all the others? Of course, let's go make some right now. Okay, great. Awesome. Come on down to Sal's Science Shop and see me, Sal, while you shop for science. This week only, Sal's one of a kind, once a year polymer sale. 50 to 75 percent off anything made of polymers. Rubber, that's a polymer. Polystyrene, when you're eating your next meal, I recommend some polypropylene. Low density polyethylene, high density polyethylene. You want some polytetrafluoroethylene? 
We got it. We've even got polychloro trifluoroethylene. Do they even know how good a deal this is? Cause you're not gonna find, you're not gonna find that kind of deal just like every day. But hold the phone. Polymers aren't just plastics. Rayon, nylon, Teflon, you name the lawn, we got it on. Sale. What, what do we, we want? want? Polymers. When, when do we, we want, want them? them? Anytime during normal business hours. Wool, silk, even cotton. Polymers, polymers, polymers. Polymers, polymers, polymers. Word has lost all meaning. Glue, paint, umbrella fabric, oh yeah. Carpet, you bet that's on sale. Roberta, I'm running out of sale signs. Buy it and I'll put it in a plastic bag, also made of polymers. Seriously, Roberta, we can't have a sale on everything. Oh, hey, hey, even you, even me, the proteins in our bodies, even our DNA, all polymers. <laughs> so come on down to South Science Shop and get a great deal on your polymers for a limited time. I mean, it'd have to be a limited time, right, Roberta? Because, I mean, I can't discount everything in the store to 75% off. How am I going to make any money? I mean, are we still rolling? One hundred different kinds of slime. Yes, it's gonna be so much fun, but we're not gonna make a hundred today. Yeah, I know. We're just gonna do our top favorites. Yeah, it's gonna be super great. All right, what are we starting with? So our first slime we're starting with today is some really cool molding slime. Now this slime, actually, if you leave it out overnight, it'll harden, and you can make an imprint of whatever you like. So here we made an imprint of our little uh, tool there. So we're gonna look at a little bit more liquidy slime, starting with this one over here, which I believe you already know about. This is cornstarch mud. Exactly. You hold this. Sounds good. I'm gonna good. hold this and we're gonna try pouring it. Oh, oh, Whoa. so. See, it's like, it's like a liquid, but then you do it fast, it's like a solid. All right, what's next? Over here, we have some other really awesome types of slime. So right over here, we have some crunchy slime. Crunchy slime? Exactly. Why is it crunchy? Now, it's crunchy because we've actually added a few beads inside of it to make it crunchy. Uh -huh. so this is some really cool, awesome slime. Here, take half. And you can feel the beads as you get to stretch it out. It's so cool. This is uh, this one is a little harder to clean. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I'll just do that. All right, so what's next? So next we have some really cool glow-in-the-dark slime. Glow-in-the-dark slime? Yeah, it's so awesome. Ooh, look at how much it glows. That glows a lot. That's super glowy slime. So to do the different kinds of slime, we need the polymer. Yes. And then the thing that sticks the polymers together. Exactly. So the glue is the polymer. Glue is the polymer. And the starch is the thing that bonds it. Yes. Uh-huh. Very cool. And then you put the thing in that makes it the, the kind of slime. Yes, right before you add the bonding component, because if we keep uh, adding stuff after it's already made, it unfortunately won't be able to take it. So we add our powder before we add our starch in this situation. Uh, should we go <laughs> on to the next thing? Yeah, let's move on to the More slime. slime. Plastic is great and plastic is everywhere. But the problem with plastic is it isn't very biodegradable. It, it doesn't break down in the environment. <laughs> I'm still on hold. Oh well. There you go. Back for another couple years, I guess. But here's a way that you can make bioplastic. It's fully biodegradable because it's made of natural materials. The recipe is easy. Two parts cornstarch, three parts water. A few drops of cooking oil and some food coloring to make it whatever color you want. Purple, science purple. Mix it up and it turns into a paste. Now what you'll need are two things. One, an adult and two, a microwave. Put it in for 30 seconds. Clock wipe. There we go. Then take it out and mix it some more until it cools down. Then you can pull it out and use your hands to sculpt it into a shape or take the shape of something else. Once you put it all the way around, you can turn it into a little flower pot. Once you've sculpted it, you need to wait for it to dry, which will take about a day. Clock wipe. After waiting a day... Uh, <clears throat> huh? Uh, what? It's been a day? Oh. You have something made out of bioplastic, like this little flower pot you can use to grow a small plant. And then when it grows big enough, you can take this biodegradable flower pot and plant it right outside in the dirt, and this pot will biodegrade and turn back into dirt. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's max it out. 
biodegradable Frisbee. Check it out. It's a Frisbee, but it's biodegradable. So you throw it around in the park, but if you lose it, it turns back into dirt. <laughs> what, not enough? Okay, clock wipe. Biodegradable lawn chair. Use it for one season and then return it to the earth afterwards. I think this is one of my best science max. I Okay, bioplastic lawn chair, not as strong as regular lawn chair. We've learned that lesson now, so that's, that's good to know. I mean, I mean, how would I have known if I hadn't tried it? Sarah and I are looking at different recipes for slime. All right, what do we got here? So over here we have some amazing foamy slime which has so, so many ingredients in it. Here, watch what happens when we start pulling it out. Ooh, wow. So it's like... Super stretchy whoa. and super fluffy. Here, that's great. Okay, now we gotta, you gotta hold yours. You gotta hold this in. Okay, you take, and then take some more. And then we take that. And then, yeah. <laughs> it gets thinner and thinner and becomes more and more lines of foamy slime. Yeah. And the last kind of slime we made today is some classic flubber slime. Woo! So much fun. Now, why do you think it's called is it flubber slime? Because it's... Is it really a slime? It is a slime, yeah. It's super fun and it's oh. super stretchy. Oh, okay, I get it. Look, look at that, and it's sort of like, like a little bit like gelatin. It is almost like gelatin. Here, you can have some. There you go, whoa. Oh, ha, ha. Uh oh. All right, so Sarah, now what we need to decide mm -hmm. is how we're gonna max it out. Right. Like, should we just get a lot of slime? That sounds like a really good idea, but we are gonna need something to put it in, because we can't just have slime all over the floor. Okay, you're right. So we'll get we'll get some sort of container thing. Yeah. And we'll see how much slime we can make, and then we'll just play with it and see what happens. Sounds good. And yeah, we will experiment, because it's science. Yeah. Okay, high high five. Careful high five, so we don't splatter. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, let's go. Oh, this is right. This is a rubber glove. Well, actually, it's a latex glove. What's the difference? I will get to that in a second, but I'm sure you can agree it's super stretchy. How stretchy? Let's fill a rubber glove with water and see how big it gets. <laughs> so, difference between latex and rubber. Well, it all comes from a rubber tree. Well, actually, it's a fake tree. It's just to show you how it works. The sap of the rubber tree is collected just like this. There's a spigot, and then the sap goes out, and it's collected. It's the same way that the sap for our maple syrup is collected. And this, this is natural latex. If it's dried out, it becomes natural rubber. Latex generally means the liquid form, and rubber means the solid form. But wait, then why is this a latex glove? <laughs> the glove is not liquid. What's the deal? Well, generally, latex means water-based or liquid, like latex paint. But it could also mean synthetic latex. That's latex that's man-made and doesn't come from a rubber tree. So, we call rubber gloves rubber gloves because they used to come from rubber trees, but now they're usually made out of man-made latex. But either way, they're super stretchy. I wonder how big this is gonna get. <laughs> Science! Sarah and I are maxing out polymer slime. How? Maxed out tub of slime! Whoa! Okay, so how do you feel? Is it, are we mixed up enough? First, we mix up a bunch of slime in a garbage bin. So with the polymer chemistry, the polymer is generally a liquid, right? Yep. And the bonding agent makes it stick together. So the more we use, the more of a solid we get. Exactly, so yeah. So we want to split it and make it sort of halfway between a liquid and a solid, and I think we're exactly at the right stage. It looks perfect. Oh, yeah. OK, so let's dump this garbage can in. All right. All right. Then we dump it in. <laughs> oh, bro. It turns out we needed more slime. Um. I don't think that's gonna be enough. I think we may need some more slime. Yeah, how much more do you think we need? So, we added 11 more. <laughs> ah, delicious. Last one. 
Oh, yeah. Then we experimented. Oh, oh yeah. We have a giant, giant tub of slime. <laughs> Because the slime is stretchy, it created amazing bubbles. So do you think I could blow a bubble with the slime? Well, do maybe I, not you, but definitely the air compressor. This? No, either, uh, no, I'd have to just put it on my face. I think yeah. I've already got it on my face. Then there was only one thing left to do. We get in the slime. Can we do that? We can totally do that. This is science math. That's so exciting. <laughs> going swimming in slime. Yes. Who's going first? You are. I am, obviously. All right, this is how science math does polymers. Three, two, one. Plastic is everywhere, but what can we do with it aside from recycle it? Well, we can reuse it to make cool plastic charms. But you're gonna need the right kind of plastic and you need polystyrene. Just look for the little number six inside the recycle symbol. Cut out some plastic and decorate it however you want. There we go. Haha, <laughs> check it out. The Science Max logo. Also, I've made a couple other things. I've got a chemical symbol, an atom, and this is me in some slime. Then get an adult to help you put it in the oven or toaster oven at 350 degrees. It only takes a few seconds for the plastic to shrink to one third its size. The reason why this happens is when plastic is manufactured, it's heated and stretched out and then cooled and it sort of freezes in that stretched out shape. And when you reheat it, it shrinks back down to the unstretched shape. Get your adult to take it out and wait for it to cool and you'll have yourself some small plastic designs you can use for keychains, bracelets, name tags, bookmarks, whatever you want all using the power of polymers. Awesome, I'm gonna make all of those. What was that again? Keychain, ornament, magnet, um... Magnetic putty in 60 seconds! This is magnetic putty! Thank you. This is magnetic putty! Ten take. This is magnetic putty! This is magnetic putty. 2,635. This is, dance. this is magnetic putty. I can't count this high. This is magnetic putty. <laughs> magnetic, oh. oh, it's not a magnet, it's attracted to magnets. Oh, that makes more sense. This is magnetic putty and this is a magnet. The putty is made of polymers, which means it can flow over itself. It also has lots of iron filings in it, which is why it's attracted to magnets. This is what happens over several minutes. And there you go, magnetic putty. Okay, so where were we? Oh yeah. Three, two, one, yeah! And remember, don't try this at home. Ah! and I enjoyed our maxed out tub of slime. So let's recap. Slime is made of polymers. Polymers come in a lot of different forms. It's all about long chains of molecules. And none are more fun to swim in than slime. Do I have slime here? Ooh, yeah, definitely. Slime here! Oh, slime! <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Science Max experiments at large. Polymers. Slime. Yeah. High fives. Yeah. Slimey high five. Yeah. Take three. Do it. Yeah. Did you see it? Is that still close? Am I too close to the camera? Biodegradable Frisbee. <laughs> Do I, am I looking at this camera? Or is it this one? Is it this one? First, you need that bowl I told James to go and wash. Forgot to ask him back for that. But hold the phone. Nylons, nylons. That's latex that is, man, what? Uh, uh, science. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. My name is 
Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. Science Max! This episode is all about chemical reactions. Om nom nom nom, om nom nom, om nom nom nom, om nom nom delicious. Reactions to make things fly, to make things glow, to make things pop, and to make things fly! <laughs> <laughs> that works! Wait, did I mention the flying? I'm, I'm sure I did, but I'm mentioning it again because it's awesome! All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Okay, Science Maximites, prepare to heart go through the cosmos! I am Captain Phil, and today we're going to be building rockets on Science Max. Now, we've, we've built rockets before, like this one, powered by air pressure. And this one, stomp rockets, which were also technically powered by air pressure. Air pressure rocket! But today, Science Maximites, we are going to be building rockets powered by chemistry! Chemical-powered rockets! Away! Mm. Okay, I promise it'll be more exciting than that. Because today, Science Maximites, we are going to be looking at chemistry. Chemistry is when two molecules combine to make another molecule. Like magic, ooh. So let's take a look at what will be powering our chemical rocket. This, it's an antacid tablet. When you put an antacid tablet in water, it makes little bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. This happens because of a reaction between two kinds of molecules called acids and bases. Like vinegar and baking soda, but all contained in a small package that won't start working until you put it in water. If we contain the reaction, the carbon dioxide gas builds up and creates pressure. High five for science. All right, so let's look at our chemical-powered rocket. What you need is one of these. This is a... This is a film canister. And ask your parents what that actually means because they're not used for holding film anymore. You can get these at craft stores, though, to hold paint or little things. But really, all you need is a plastic container with a good lid that snaps on nice and tight and keeps the air in. And then, of course, what you need are your antacid tablets and a little bit of water. So pour in some water and then put in your antacid tablet and snap the lid on. Flip it over and wait for the carbon dioxide gas to build up, which will build up pressure, which will... Launch your rocket! Ha-ha! <laughs> so there you go, a chemical-powered rocket. Come on, let's max it out. So first, I need an expert to help me. Um, let's... Oh, Lisa from Logics Academy, of course! Logics Academy people have helped me launch all the rockets on Science Max. This is gonna be great. Uh, oh, I'm gonna get my helmet first. Okay, let's launch. Let's launch some rockets. Let's go. Whoa! Wow, it's really dark in this room. I can't see anything. Bill. Lisa. Bill. Lisa. Bill. Oh. 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 Where did this come from? Uh, I guess the portal's malfunctioning. Hey, Lisa! Hi! From Logics Academy, great to have you here. Great to be here. Let's put this over there. We are here to max out the chemistry rocket! Ooh, what is that? It's just a small plastic container. But when we put an antacid tablet in there and some water... Ah, we get a chemical reaction. We get a chemical reaction, and so that's what creates the pressure and then that pops the lid off and we get a little rocket. Kaboom! But now we're going to max it out. Get a bigger container Ooh, and more... Wait. What? How about if we launch a whole bunch of them? Ooh, so we just get a lot of the small one mm -hmm. and we launch them all at the same time. Exactly. Okay, great. So we just need a whole bunch of these and yeah. a whole bunch of... And a whole bunch of science antacid. Yeah, well, that's okay. I get them both in bulk. Come on, <laughs> let's go, go put it together. And I'm a base, and we are enemies. Ooh. Ooh. 
well, we're not really enemies. Yeah, that's true. It's all about how we react chemically. You see, as an acid, I really want to give protons away. Protons, who needs your protons? Get your protons here. Protons, I got more than I want. I don't need them anymore. And bases, we need protons. We'll do anything to get them. Uh, protons, you can protons away. I'll take some, I'll take some protons. You think that when you get these two together, you'd have some pretty great chemistry. But the truth is, when they're together, they often don't react. Whoa. That is, until water gets involved. Once you have water, acids and bases react. Wow. Here, take some protons. All your bases belong to us. <laughs> you go. Take some protons. I don't need more. I want more. I want more some of protons. Those. Here. Water is a solvent, allowing the chemical reactions to take place. <laughs> Depending on the strength of the acids and bases, that reaction can be mild, would you like a proton? Oh, no, really, I could. Please, please take it. Oh, well, thank you, that's very generous. Have another. No, perhaps, maybe I will. Here's yes, one. Okay, um, maybe just one. But if the acids and bases are strong, the chemical reaction can be really extreme. <laughs> this is what's going on in the antacid tablet, and why, without water, nothing happens. Oh, water! Water! Come on! Adam, what did you do? What? Last one. Lisa and I are maxing out our chemical-powered rocket not by making it bigger, but by making more of them. How many more? 400 caps all glued down, 400 antacid tablets, or part of, yep. all glued down, and they're glued on this fancy-pantsy spinning surface. Hmm. So we rotate this part upside down. We fill each container with a little water and snap it on underneath. This way, the antacid tablet and the water don't mix until we flip it back over. It also allows us time to snap them all on. Okay, ready? Ready. All right, 400 containers. Here we go. Let's do it. Once we flip the board back over, the reaction started taking place, building up carbon dioxide gas and increasing the pressure until... Oh. Whoa. on that. Yep. That worked spectacularly. That was awesome. So we've done this. Let's go bigger. Let's go bigger. bigger. Oh, okay. Definitely. So let's go and we'll clean right. this up afterwards. Yep, okay. Let's do it. Okay, let it go. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> this is a balloon and this is an orange. When you put them together, a chemical reaction happens. Ah, how'd you go in there for a minute, didn't I? It, no, no, all right. Well, you can actually do a chemical reaction between a balloon and an orange. You see, balloons are made of latex, which is a kind of polymer that's very, very stretchy. And orange peels contain a chemical called limonene. Limonene breaks down latex. <laughs> so, we have three questions. The first is, why does this happen? Well, like I said, it's all chemistry. You see, balloons are made of polymers. Chains of molecules held together by chemical bonds. A limonene molecule attacks those bonds. Om nom nom nom, om nom nom, om nom nom nom, om nom nom, delicious. And breaks it, that separates the polymers, and that pops the balloon. But remember, it only works with natural latex. So make sure you're using natural latex balloons. Second question, why do they call it limonene when it's in orange peels? I mean, yes, it's in lime peels and lemon peels, but the chemical itself smells like oranges. They should call it orangenine or, or citrus fruitinide or... Anyway, third question, should we max it out? Of course we should, come on. 200 balloons versus two bottles of limonene. Ready, go.
sixth attempt to max out our chemical rocket was 400 plastic containers. Oh, yeah. That worked well, but now it's time to make the container larger. Whoa! Giant maxed out chemistry rocket canister. I have a big plastic container with a groovy lid that sits there on airtight, which is great. And I have a giant jar of antacid. How many? It was like 60 antacid tablets or something? At least. This works exactly the same as our smaller containers. We dump the antacid in, seal the lid airtight, and then flip it over. And now would be a good time to mention not to try this at home. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, it's not oh, going to take God. long. So that was the canister version. Now we need the pop bottle version, the yes. rocket version. Yes. OK, let's go make that. Let's do it. OK. Me Max. This is a light stick. It creates light using a chemical reaction. There's a liquid chemical inside and also a glass container that holds another chemical. When you bend the light stick, you break open the container and the two chemicals mix, creating light. There you go, light sticks, chemical reaction. And yes, of course, we're gonna max it out. This is a whole bunch of the two chemicals in a light stick. Let's max it out. So how does a chemical reaction produce light? Well, a lot of chemical reactions produce energy. You might think of a chemical reaction producing heat. Well, heat is a kind of energy. This chemical reaction also produces energy, just energy in the form of light. It's just a different kind of energy. Whoa, that's no light stick. <laughs> and now for a Science Max quiz. Chemical change or not? What's a chemical change? Well, let's demonstrate. Look at this. It's a happy little molecule of iron. And here's another molecule of oxygen. If they were to have a chemical change, they would react and form different molecules. Look, it's a molecule of rust. Rust is a different chemical than either iron or oxygen. It's a chemical change. Now, if these molecules mixed and did not change, then it's not a chemical change, it's a physical change. Sometimes it's hard to tell if it's a chemical change just by looking, but asking what kind of change it is leads to good science. So let's look at some examples. Vinegar and baking soda. Is it a chemical change? Yes. Vinegar and baking soda react to form different chemicals. Sodium acetate, that's the white stuff that's left over, and carbon dioxide, which makes the bubbles. How about a nucleation fountain with diet cola and mints? Haha! -ha. A lot of people think that's a chemical change, but it's not. The mints cause carbonation, the bubbles, to escape faster. But in the end, you still have cola and mints, no new chemicals. And without the carbonation, nothing happens. So it's a physical change. Take a guess at this one, glow stick chemicals. Well, producing light or heat is usually a sign of a chemical change. How about mixing sugar and water to make a sugar pop? That's a physical change. You start with sugar and water, you mix them, and when you have a sugar pop, what chemicals are you left with? Well, sugar and water. So, no chemical change. It can be hard to tell sometimes, but whenever two things mix, think to yourself if it's a chemical change or a physical change. And now you know it's either one or the other. And that's the first step to good science. Thanks for playing our Science Max quiz. Our maxed out rocket worked great. <laughs> <laughs> now to make it look more like a rocket. So we have a mesh bag here to put the antacid in. Right. And we have um, some paper clips attached to it. And what are the paper clips for? Well, Phil, we have a magnet. Ah. And so the magnet sticks to the paper clip. And so that's what we have here. You see, the bag is full of the antacid tablets, which we put through the mouth of the bottle and the magnet is holding the paper clips on the other side of the plastic. So we can sort of move it along. So we can start with the bag over here where the water's down there, but now we attach the launcher, like so. All this effort is to keep the reaction from happening until the bottle's on the launcher 